second here. All right, there we go. We're in. All right, welcome back, everybody. Today we have an interesting conversation. Joe, welcome back. It's it's you're here again as usual. Um, Dr. Ryan Mullins is first time guest. Dr. Ryan Mullins, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Of course, Joe, thank you for coming back. I know you're always down to talk philosophy, so it's good to have you. Um, all right, so today we got an interesting conversation. We're talking about classical theism, divine timelessness, immutability, problems for all that and everything. Um, so some interesting, so particularly I believe it's an ex nihilo argument against divine timelessness that Dr. Mullins has come up with. So we're going to be talking about that, going through some like possible objections that one might hear, maybe some additional support of premises or certain objections. So um, yeah, we want to just jump right into it. I guess we could start off defining, I think Dr. Mullins, you said you wanted to start off defining like what we meant by classical theism. We can start there kind of to distinguish what we're talking about this problem. So uh, unless there's anything else preliminary from anybody, we can, I guess, just jump right into it. Yep. Okay, well, I'll do it. So, right, yeah. so classical theism, what I, as I understand it, has four unique attributes that it affirms that no other model of God affirms, supposedly. Uh, panentheists are weird because panentheists, they affirm everything and nothing, so they're tricky. So classical theism says God is timeless, God is immutable, God is simple, and God is impassable. And they'll still say things like God's, you know, all knowing, he's all powerful, but lots of, you know, models of God will agree on that. So what's unique is those four attributes of timelessness, immutability, simplicity, and impassibility. So timelessness means that God exists without beginning, without end, without succession, without temporal location. Uh, and you can't have any sort of temporal relationships with anything. So not even simultan like simultaneity. So like Paul Helm's really big on this. He'll say, look, if you think God's like simultaneous with some temporal moment, then that's a temporal relationship. So God would be, you know, in time in some sense. And so we can't even have that. So we really have to get rid of all these kind of things. Whereas, whereas like somebody like me who thinks God's temporal, I'm going to say God's eternal and that God exists without beginning, without end. But God does have succession. He does do one thing after the next. He does have new moments in his life. He does have temporal location because he exists now, just like you and I do. Whereas the, the classical, he's going to have to say, no, none of that. So that's timelessness. Immutability is like really closely connected to this because there's a tight conceptual uh, connection between time and change. So if there is change, everybody will agree that time exists. Some people think time can exist without change, but everybody agrees that at least if there is change uh, occurring, then there's time. So what the immutability quite literally means unchanging, but you need to understand how strong this claim is. So God does not change intrinsically, but God also does not change extrinsically. And this is straight out of a bunch of different classical thinkers like Peter Lombard, uh, St. Augustine, and so on. So it's a very, very strong claim. And the contemporary thinkers like Paul Helm uh, see this as well. They'll say, like, if God changes extrinsically, like he changes in relationship to you and I, well, then he's still going to be undergoing succession. So you really have to get rid of extrinsic changes and relational changes. This is connected to divine simplicity because part of the claim of simplicity is that God does not have any accidental properties. And if you're undergoing extrinsic changes, then you would be gaining and losing accidental properties. And so simplicity is like, well, get rid of those altogether. So then you get rid of any sort of extrinsic uh, properties that God might have or any extrinsic changes God might have. You'd also be getting rid of any intrinsic changes God might undergo because God doesn't have any accidental properties. But simplicity goes further. So simplicity is going to say whatever essential attribute you want to say God has, be it omnipotence, omniscience, whatever, those are identical to each other and identical to God's essence and existence. And then further, God has no potential whatsoever. He is purely actual. Uh, so and all of his actions are identical to each other, such that there's only one act, and this one act is identical to God's essence and existence. So it's a very, very strong claim. Uh, so strong that even like some different uh, Islamic thinkers and then in the Christian tradition, someone like Anselm is going to say, none of your conceptual distinctions apply to God because what you can divide in your mind, you can divide in reality. So I can make conceptual distinctions in my head, but they do not apply to, to the simple God at all. So those are out. And then the final attribute is impassibility, which says that God cannot suffer. It's impossible for God to suffer. It is impossible for God to be caused or influenced by anything outside of himself. And it is impossible for God to have any emotion that is irrational, immoral, and inconsistent with perfect, pure, undisturbed happiness. So those are the four classical attributes. Okay, got it. 
Yeah, that's good. I think, yeah, anything there, Joe? Um, I guess I just have one question on um, immutability with respect to intrinsic and extrinsic changes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of classical theists are keen on sort of Cambridge changes, which are, mm -hmm. you know, like sort of extrinsically relational changes. So you're changing your relation to something else something else that changes intrinsically, but you yourself yep. don't change intrinsically. Um, so are you saying that classical theists sort of, like even, even Cambridge changes aren't applicable to that because they're sort of extrinsically yes. relational? Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah, but, so this is so Boethius. Because it's still, okay. Yeah, so Boethius gives this example that we now call Cambridge change. Uh, and he says, this doesn't even apply to God because the category of relation does not apply to God at all. Uh, and then Augustine has some similar passages where he's looking at what we would now call Cambridge changes. And he'll, and he'll say... God is not really related to the universe, which means that God does not have any of the accidental properties that you would have from a relation. And I can explain that more in a minute. But the whole point of denying that God's really related to the universe is explicitly to deny that God has these accidental properties that you would have from just merely being related to something. So it's, it's, it's the whole point of it is just to get rid of relational changes. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I think that helps figure it out. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of our, a lot we're going to talk about later is going to... Um, apply to like Cambridge changes. We'll talk mm -hmm. about those. So we can come back to more of that. Cause I know Phaser draws that distinction a lot. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's good to, I, I guess one question I have too would be, I, I know you mentioned that like the difference between you and um, say like most classical theists would be, you say, you know, God's still eternal, but it's just temporal successions. Um, in terms of the discussion we're going to have, are there any other like differences between the classical theist models and maybe some other models that are popular that are going to be important here? Like any other differences? Yeah, so the main models that are on offer today are the classical theist model and then what you call neoclassical theism, which is where you reject one or more of those big four that I mentioned, but you don't reject the claim that God knows the future. So you're not an open theist. So someone like William Lane Craig, who thinks God has like this middle knowledge uh, and, and so God knows the future, Craig is going to say timelessness, false. Immutability, false. Simplicity, that's just incoherent. Uh, impassibility, that's just unbiblical. But does God know the future? Of course he does. So I'm not an open theist. And so that's what Craig's going to say. Whereas someone like William Hasker, they're an open theist. And he's going to go one step further and say, I'm going to get rid of foreknowledge too. And, and so I've got this you know, unique model of God and, and how I understand how God interacts with the world. Whereas the next models are usually something like panentheism and pantheism. And so pantheism says God is identical to the universe or the universe is somehow like constituted of God, whatever that means. And then panentheism, I, I've written a bunch on this. I'm really struggling to figure out what they're saying. So they'll say the universe is in God in some sense, um, but God's more than the universe. And when you try to pin them down, the best I can get at is you deny the doctrine of creation out of nothing, and you say that God has always existed with a universe of some sort. So you, have, you affirm what's called eternal creation, and we'll get into that more later. But that's the main claim I can see that, that like, so someone like uh, Benedict Gurka, who's one of the leading panentheists today, He'll say that's what we need to say. Panentheism is like one really essential element of panentheism is that you deny creation ex nihilo and you say that God always exists with the universe of some sort. So those are kind of the big models of God on offer today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think some of those terms like neoclassical, that's all more helpful than like just theistic personalist label that is often right. just very generalized because that's people use that for like Plantinga, Swinburne, and Craig, and it's like well these guys have different views. So. That's right. more helpful to talk about, like the actual distinction. Someone like Josh Rasmussen, who strikes me as kind of a panentheist, but also sort of neoclassical. I don't know, Joe. You might have a better. I have no idea what he is, he, but something in that sort of vein. So I think it's helpful to talk about the um, kind of more specific stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, where they disagree on things and like knowledge. We'll talk about knowledge too in a little bit. Um, okay, so that's all good. So do we, if we want to, we can get into um, defining the four kind of I think things you had here. Uh, so emanation, creation, eternal creation, and creation ex nihilo. Um, Joe and I, I know are both are really interested in the ex nihilo stuff, so we're excited to talk about this. So if you want right. to, um, we can go through. We can start with emanation. Talk about like how you're defining that, and see if we have any questions. I don't know that we'll have any questions on the first two. It'll probably be just like the last two. But in right. any case, if you want to go through those. Yeah, so when you're talking about, there's this distinction between um, emanation and creation. And in contemporary discussions, people just seem like they're conflating uh, creation ex nihilo into this sort of creation category. 
And so I'm trying to look through a lot of historical sources, look at different medieval debates in, within Christianity and within uh, uh, Islam and try to figure out what's going on here. And so you'll have these different people claim they either affirm emanation or they reject it. And so it's a bit difficult sometimes to pin down what they're saying. So it looks like something like this as far as I can tell. So an emanation is something like this. So like you'd say um, the universe just kind of like necessarily follows from God. So I, to define it a little bit more uh, like closely, I guess you could say like an emanation occurs if and only if like a particular universe or a set of universes or all possible universes necessarily follow from the nature of God. So sometimes uh, you might see someone say something like this. They'll say, because God is perfectly good, he's just, his goodness is just like diffusive. And so it just entails all possible things that could exist. They just do exist because it's good for these things to exist. So something about God's goodness just entails all these possibilities, like they just do exist. They just necessarily follow from God. Whereas a creation is supposed to be something like this. Like a creation occurs, like if and only if, like a particular universe, a set of universes, or all the possible universes, uh, they're like the result of God freely causing them to exist. Oh, okay. So that's, that's supposed to be the distinction. One is the emanation is like it just necessarily follows from God. Creation is supposed to be freely some sort of free act on god's part okay yeah so um i i have i guess have a couple like little things here that'll probably mm -hmm. be short and then joe if you have anything uh, i guess so it sounds like you're gonna want to affirm a creation over an emanation model I, I could be wrong in this but it strikes me that like emanation if we have this you know it necessarily follows from god that a particular universe or set of universes um I guess my one question would be, does that, would that entail like modal collapse at a yeah, level? Yeah, you just get modal collapse, it seems. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So some people are happy with that. Uh, so like Avicenna, like in the Islamic tradition, he's like, look, you know, uh, I gave you, you wanted a necessarily existent God. Well, you know, you're going to get all these other necessarily existent things. And people be like, well, I don't like that. And he's like, you wanted a necessarily existent God who's pure actuality. Like, I'm sorry, I gave it to you. What do you want? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, like not everybody's happy with that. So there's some other thinkers in the Islamic tradition who go like, no, we really want to have some some sense in which God is eternally creating like this emanation account. But we want it to be in some sense where God has some kind of freedom. So he has some like freedom to say maybe this universe and not that universe. You know, maybe he has to create a universe of some sort, but, you know, he's got options. So someone like uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is um, uh, is Islamic thinker from the Middle Ages. He'll say creation ex nihilo is false, but I want to affirm what I'll call eternal creation, where God is always creating a universe of some sort. So, but but it's it's the case that God's like freely bringing it about because he has some sort of discretion of this universe or over that universe. But there's never a moment where God exists without a universe of some sort because he's always creating from eternity past. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, there's some weird questions with emanation because it's like why does where I feel like creation has better explanatory power because emanation, it's like, well, okay, well, if that's not necessitating, then why does this universe exist as opposed to some other? And whereas yeah. creation, we have reasons. And because this gets into like problems with uh, like contingency and theistic explanation. And I think like Alex Proust has offered that like, you know, the explanation for this universe could be like a freely caused, uh, just like a freely caused decision by God to create a particular mm -hmm. universe, like in in line with the PSR and all that. So yeah, it seems like the creation model at least is going to be more plausible it, for theists and for probably some yeah. Christian reasons to prefer it as well, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, grace. I mean, grace is freely bestowed. I mean, that's like the definition of grace, um, mm -hmm. freely yeah. bestowed. And of course, libertarian freedom. I mean, <laughs> you, pretty much, yeah. you want those things, you're going to need, yeah. you're going to want to get rid of uh, emanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, here's one good. way you could kind of... I guess you could change things a little bit here. So say you're like a, a panentheist of some sort and you think God never exists without a universe, but you also deny that God knows the future, say the future is completely open. So you could say it's necessary that uh, God has to, has to, you know, just emanates like all these things that, that could possibly exist. He emanates them, but the future is completely open. So what are those things going to do? Well, some of those things have free will. What are they going to do? Mm, I don't know. Nobody knows. The future is completely open. So you get... These things that have to exist, they necessarily have to exist. But what are they going to do with that uh, after they exist? Ooh, no, I don't know. So you don't get a modal collapse there. You get the yeah. necessity of, of the universe, but you wouldn't get the necessity of the future. So you've got that option. But no classical theist was going to do that because they want to say God knows the future. And they want to say the future is settled in some sort of sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, classical theists are, don't have open theism as the option, I don't think. So. No, no <laughs> they, definitely not. That'd be problematic for them. Okay.
So yeah, that's good to clarify some things there. Um, we can go on to eternal creation unless Joe, you had anything else on emanation and creation. Or are you good? Yeah, no, my, my, my major questions were with eternal creation and creation ex nihilo, those definitions. And then we, right, well, we, we can flesh that when we get into the problems. Yeah. But. Okay, so let's, yeah. Yeah, so let's define these then. So, so the creation, like I said, just gives you this claim that God like, freely causes stuff to exist. So when I was talking about like, Ibn Taymiyyah earlier, he wants to say he affirms uh, some kind of creation, he rejects emanation, but he also says, yeah, I reject creation ex nihilo. And so I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And so the claim is this. So eternal creation, uh, I define as an eternal creation occurs if and only if a particular universe, a set of universes, or all possible universes are freely caused to exist by God. And there is no state of affairs where God exists without a particular universe, set of universes, or all possible universes. So from all eternity, you've got God creating. There's never a moment where you've got God and nothing else. And so I think this is the main thing that distinguishes eternal creation from creation ex nihilo. And so creation ex nihilo, it's got the the first half is going to agree. The first half of the definition is going to agree with eternal creation. It's the second half that disagrees. So let me tell you like the definition. So creation ex nihilo occurs if and only if a particular universe, set of universes, or all possible universes are freely caused to exist by God, and there is a pre-creation moment or a state of affairs where God exists without a particular universe, set of universes, or all possible universes. So that's the biggest difference. So eternal creation from all eternity, you've got God and everything else. And eternal and then creation ex nihilo, you've got God with nothing. And then somehow God plus everything else that he creates. Okay, okay. yeah. So I had um, a quick question there about mm -hmm. the sort of, at least within the, the creation ex nihilo definition, the sort of pre-creation moment or state of affairs. So I'm wondering what the, the relevant notion of priority is here. So mm -hmm. um, is it a sort of ontological priority, like a metaphysical priority, or maybe is it like even a temporal priority in terms of like non-metric time, like mm -hmm. before a metric time came to exist for the universe? Like, I'm, I'm, I mean, if you could elaborate on that. Um. Yeah, so is this is something that classical theists and then neoclassical open theists, they can all agree on this pre-creation moment that there is one, but they're going to disagree on how you understand it. So I would take it to be that this pre-creation moment is a temporal moment and it lacks any metrication because I think um, <clears throat> metrics or the way you measure time that exists if and only if you have consistent laws of nature that provide a nice, like a uh, consistent change uh, in the universe by which you can develop measurements. Because uh, without, without that, I don't think you can develop a clock or any measurements whatsoever. Uh, so someone like Richard Swinburne, Dean Zimmerman, myself, they're going to affirm that. Uh, someone like William Hasker is going to say, it seems like there's like this, this series of moments uh, before God creates the universe. I don't think he's going to say there's a metrication there, but he's never really written on this. But he thinks it's a whole series of moments where I'm just like, it's just one moment without any sort of like distinctions or anything happening. But it's a temporal moment. Uh, the classical theist, though, is going to say it's a timeless moment because God's timeless. It couldn't be a temporal moment. But they don't really develop any sort of details of what that looks like until you get to like John Duns Scotus in the late Middle Ages and on into like the scholastic era and the Protestant Catholic traditions. So they'll start talking in terms of like these logical distinctions, these logical moments in the life of God. But that's still not going to get the job done to, because um, it's there's still it's a stronger claim that there's this there just literally is nothing with God. Uh, and so it's trying to figure out how you're going to get that. It's 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 not clear in the slightest. OK, Joe, is that does that answer your as I'm well enough? Because I have a question on creation. Mine, we'll flush this out. Okay, if if you want to ask your question, mine like lagged out a little bit. So mm. I, I got to the point where you heard um, where you were talking about Hasker and how you know he had a series of moments, and you're like, yes. well, I mean, how does this collapse into just one moment? Because there's no metrication there. Um, yeah. But then you went on for maybe about 10, 15 seconds explaining another oh, view, the classical? and I just did, I just didn't yeah. get it because it was just lagging. I mean, yeah. Sorry. So long long story short, the classical view wants to say that there's this timeless moment, but they don't, they're like the burden is trying to figure out how can you have this timeless moment uh, where God exists without anything and it still be the same timeless moment where God exists with stuff. And so you can talk about ontological priority, but that still doesn't seem like that really gets at the, the heart of this claim though, like God literally exists without anything. And, and classical theists make a really big deal about there's nothing. Because if you had God, uh, you had God and everything else existing, they're gonna be like, well, then that's creation, like eternal creation. And we don't want that. Because oh, whatever cool. begins okay. to exist yeah. cannot be co-eternal with a being that ever begins to exist. 
And so you'll see this in a lot of the early church fathers, like Augustine, John of Damascus, they'll make these sort of moves to say, this is what distinguishes us from all the pagan philosophers who deny creation out of nothing, is the universe begins to exist, and so it cannot be co-eternal with God. Okay. Did you, so, Joe, now do you have anything else, or does that satisfy your question there? No, I, I definitely think it adds the clarity. I mean, I'm just wondering if, like, the classical theists will, like, just refuse to to grant this understanding of creation ex nihilo so like aquinas mm. as you know famously held that god could still be a creator even ex yeah. nihilo under a past eternal model of the universe so like yeah. even if god and the universe are equally eternal or beginningless it seems as though god can still create ex nihilo and, and the way that they understand yeah. it as you probably know of course is that uh, creation ex nihilo is a sort of bestowal of being to another without yeah. using some pre-existent stuff in doing it right, right. so it's like an absolute yeah. bringing into being um yeah. without acting on or refashioning something prior so yeah. i'm wondering if you can maybe speak to that just a little bit yeah so so aquinas there so he, he doesn't want to deny what aristotle says because he's the scientist and we all know we have to agree with science uh <laughs> you know whatever like whatever the scientist says we have to agree with it uh, but he's like but our faith teaches us that the universe begins to exist and so he's like what do i do and he's like well there are good philosophical reasons you could affirm this eternal creation view uh, but the faith teaches us that you could affirm, uh, you know, creation ex nihilo. And you're like, cool, okay, well, which one do you affirm? And he's like, eh, you know, like, we could, we could, you could go with both ways. And he just kind of, like, doesn't really want to touch on it. Because if he really wants to come down with, like, the eternal creation view, then he's really giving up, uh, like, the, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. And he knows this because in the Islamic tradition, that debate is raging right there and then. Like, there are a bunch of pe people in the Islamic tradition going, creation ex nihilo means universe began and it is not eternal in the past. And then these other people who are from this emanation view or an eternal creation view are going, yeah, we give up uh, eternal, uh, we give up creation ex nihilo and we want to say the universe has always existed in the past. So they've got a lot more clarity than I think Aquinas is willing to give in some of these spots. Um, yeah. And also to point out, just because Aquinas said something doesn't mean it's true. You've got the rest of the classical tradition who affirms creation ex nihilo saying it means this. It doesn't mean eternal creation in the past. So careful ryan yeah. do you just do you want 100 comments from the thomas you just say aquinas sure, wasn't right about everything i mean <laughs> i think he's already got them <laughs> i've already got them i mean aquinas yeah. is my personal lord and savior he is my infallible you know uh god but you know whatever whatever <laughs> i, well, I think like, that brings some your questions, what if you have any, but we can move on to your questions for it if you had any um, yeah about his yeah name. yeah I had I just had one about um I, well I think kind of what you guys have talked about brings some clarity to it so it may have been answered already but I was just mine was more on the eternal creation section because the second part of it said like there's no state of affairs where God exists that a particular universe is set of universes all that so my question was just for clarity on like what state of affairs means there like do states of affairs have to be temporal because I feel like there could be and that kind of has some weight on the ex nihilo problem too like if we could have states of affairs and I'll, I'll have some more on this to flesh out once we talk about the particular mm -hmm. issues but it seems like there could be this distinction like there could be maybe more like ontological states of affairs more just like global causal structure states of affairs that don't have to do specifically with like temporal succession so i was right. just wondering if like you know the states of affairs there like for more clarity if they can be like non-temporal and if it, if so if that has any yeah. like ramifications here i'm trying to leave it as vague as possible because you've got some people wanting to say it's it's all timeless so like proclus is a ancient pagan philosopher who says creation ex nihilo what are you christians talking about that's nuts uh like you can't have that god will be changing in all these terrible ways so we have to affirm eternal creation and he thinks god's timeless and he thinks eternal creation is the only way to affirm that god is timeless so this sort of state of affairs can be timeless state of affairs. How do you te tease that out? I don't know. Proclus doesn't tell me. So I'm like, yeah, okay. Whereas Ibn Taymiyyah, this uh, Islamic philosopher I've mentioned a few times, he wants to say, you can't get timelessness, full stop. Like, you just can't get it. Um, God's going to be temporal, uh, but we're going to have to have this eternal creation, though, because you, like, as a, you know, like it just doesn't make any sense to have creation out of nothing because it just doesn't seem to make sense with God having reasons and and acting for reasons it's it's very complicated so i've got someone there who's going to say these are all temporal states of affairs temporal events and so trying to capture both of these claims in a definition of eternal creation because they both say they're affirming it that's why i'm trying to just use say, oh, okay. state of affairs yeah so i'm trying to capture as many I things as i can yeah yeah i asked for clarity because it comes in on the ex nihilo point where it says like there's a pre-creation moment or state of affairs and it's like well, yeah. we're talking about timelessness in the ex nihilo yeah. case like if that state of affairs is not a moment and instead just some like metaphysical state of affairs that could maybe i don't know help or hurt but i do share the intuition that like thinking of 
ex nihilo without change is strange. So, yeah. Um, yes, that's why I ask. But that's good for Claire. I mean, there's so much to the tradition, so leaving that open is generally good. I guess the only question I had is um, on ex nihilo. I mean, we'll probably talk about some of these causal principles as we get into it more because we're talking a lot about like just general principles of causality. But uh, I'm sure you might be familiar with Felipe Leon's ex nihilo argument, his principle material causality argument. Um, so, Joe, you might be able to spell that out better than I can even. Yeah, but like how, if, what ramifications this may have or how it might be relevant. Do you want to run through that one real quick, Joe? Yeah, I sure. Know it, so, I know it better. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going off memory here and I'm doing this sort of extemporaneously. So um, his principle of material causality says roughly that um, everything that has an originating or sustaining efficient cause of its existence is also such that it has a material cause of its existence. Um, so for instance, like a, a candle, um, presumably the oxygen is a sort of sustaining cause uh, of the flame, uh, but it also has a material cause in terms of, you know, you can cite various chemical, physical factors or whatever. And, you know, he uses a bunch of intuition pumps, uh, empirical generalizations, appeal to abduction, other reasons to support this. And he mounts it as an argument against uh, creation ex nihilo, uh, mm. Because he says, well, if creation ex nihilo is true, well, then you have something, namely the material universe uh, or material reality, uh, which has an originating or sustaining cause, but that lacks a material cause of its existence. But per my principle, uh, that's not true or that cannot be true. And hence, classical theism is false. That's his argument. Um, right. Yeah. So that would, well, it wouldn't, it would entail not just that classical theism is false, but any model of God that, well, okay, any model of God that wants to affirm creation on nothing, it would, it would. Yeah, entailed like that though they're they're false uh yeah but it wouldn't be a big deal for it's a radical people. i mean yeah I'm, yeah i'm not saying yeah. it's like i'm not saying it's 100 good i'm not saying it's bad it's it's a, i mean it's a pretty radical yeah. claim it is because i guess because i've got different intuitions here so i've got these intuitions that um like my mind i can you know my mind is non-physical i think i'm a substance dualist uh which i know is not popular these days but you know i do lots of things that are not popular so whatever so I think I'm a mind and I think I have thoughts and I think my thoughts can cause other thoughts and bring other thoughts into existence. So there are some of the arguments I develop, you know, I, I made those come into existence. Does that all material cause? Not as far as I could tell. Uh, mm, you know, it, yeah, it seems odd to me. Because it seems like I've got like, yeah, everyday experience of mental causation and mental causes bringing about mental effects. And that would yeah, violate yeah, that's, that's, this, this principle. I'm assuming he, he deals with this, though. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think he does. Um, I know he has, like, one or two papers where he's developing this, um, especially, I think he develops it in his paper, Causation Insufficient in Reason. Um, but okay. um, that, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to write a paper on that in a few months. I haven't started it yet because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm working on some other projects. So, But that was one of my original things. It's like, well, hold on a second. I mean, the mind... I mean, we don't want to just presuppose materialism from the get-go with respect to the right. mind, and so we've got seemingly originating or sustaining causes that lack material causes. But I, I, th I think he might, he probably deals with it, so. Yeah. But so we could, I, we could yeah. probably bracket that for... <laughs> sure. I think it's yeah, a good thing I, to bring up, Mike, but we could probably bracket it and start going on yeah, the, yeah. the problems in the paper. Yeah, okay. it's interesting to think about in relation to this, but yeah, not as, uh, it'll not be as relevant as the other one okay so we got some clarity there on what we're all talking about so that's good to start so yeah let's just get get right into it in the paper here so you you say in this little blurb you gave us that like most christians have affirmed like the universe has a temporal beginning where as mm -hmm. god doesn't and so you know therefore there's going to be some problems for people that say there's a timeless moment and all that so if you want to run through kind of maybe the christian view on that and why it's important or just kind of if you want to set up kind of your problems here yeah, so let me, I guess, explain why the classical theist thinks this is so important. So uh, a lot of classical theists in the Christian tradition, they want to say it's so important that we have this, this claim that God exists without the universe because it helps illustrate God's freedom and his sovereignty. So they'll say from like this, this moment where like uh, so Arthur W. Pink has this really like, really like colorful way of stating it. He's like this moment, we can't even call it time, but there's this moment where God exists with nothing else, no angels to sing his praises, no people to, you know, to think about him or pray to him, nothing else at all, just God alone in solitary glory. And you're like, okay, cool. Why is that so important? And they're like, well, because it distinguishes us from the emanationist views. So we can have a really clear way of saying God is free, whereas the emanationist view cannot. 
And it distinguishes us from all these eternal creation views because we can, again, talk again about God having this sort of greater freedom. Uh, and then they'll also emphasize it for doctrines like predestination um, because they want to say nothing is around to influence God's decision of how he wants the timeline to go because nothing else exists. God alone is sovereign to be able to go. I want that timeline or that timeline. So they're like, they're, so they're really big on this. Now, it seems though that like, you've got a million different ways you could say God changes, but here's the basic idea. It seems like you've got God with nothing and then also God with all this other stuff. And that looks like a really clear change in the life of God. God without by himself, God in this solitary glory, and then God with, you know, whatever he creates. And if that's not a change in the life of God, then I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. But a lot of people don't find this, for some reason, a bunch of classical theists just kind of like want to wave their hand at this. And so I'm like, okay, what are a bunch of different ways to tease out all the ways it seems incredibly obvious that God is changing? And so then really forcing the classical theist to go, I, can I really wave my hand away at all of this? Or, or is it now starting to look like I'm just saying really implausible things? So that's the, that's the, that's the kind of basic strategy here is try to make the classical theist say as many implausible things as possible in order to try to get out of this. Okay. So, Fair. yeah. So, yeah. So here's um, one way you could say God changes. So like I've already, like, so I've said like, you know, it looks like God changes from being alone to existing with a universe. And I don't know how you're going to explain that away. Uh, like you could try to say like, oh, Cambridge changes or something. And I'm like, that's still a new moment in the life of God. Because if I'm sitting around and there's nothing around me and all of a sudden there's like stuff around me, that's clearly a new moment in my life. How are you going to explain that away? I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that, or do you want me to move on to the next one? Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna talk end up talking a lot about Cambridge changes because like mm -hmm. the first like three or four, Joe and I were both like we think these are Cambridge changes, but we want to talk about them more. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything on that first one, Joe. I just tend to think that like it's just weird, like all the stuff we've already talked about about it, like like there's a one moment where God doesn't exist with anything. It's like well, why is it one moment as opposed to two or three or a hundred, as sure. well as because like it's a timeless like, moment, right? It's yeah, like when, right, yeah. What and what? What, um, is, what is a moment even when there's no time? So like, how does that even make mm -hmm. sense? It's just again. Oh, I can make sense of that though. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's more of like what I talked about, just like the state of affairs, or it's a different, different kind of time, like divine time or whatever. But they're going to deny that. I don't know. My first thing on that would be, I don't. Yeah, I find it weird to posit that as a Cambridge change, like that whole thing. But I mean, they're going to say there's not like. Because the classical theists are going to say, like, at a phenomenological level, there's not, like, God with nothing and God with something. Like, he's eternally, because if it's identical to his active knowledge, which we'll talk about all this later, but mm -hmm. yeah. identical to his active knowledge, like, he's going to gain, like, new knowledge of, like, all this stuff around him, or he's not going to, like, it's like, all of a sudden he's there, and then all of a sudden there's stuff around him. It's more so, like, he's he's eternally aware, and he's always existing in the moment with stuff around him. So it's not like he's gaining new knowledge. But that, that just bleeds into all the other problems. I don't know. It's just... Because it's like, I feel like I know what the classical theists are going to say, right? Like, that's what they're going to say. But, like, also, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know if that makes sense. So, uh, Joe, what did you have anything else there? I'm sure you got some. Yeah, so I think we should really hammer down our notion of Cambridge change uh, before mm -hmm. going on. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a rough start is something like um, X Cambridge changes. Hmm, I, I probably can't provide necessary and sufficient conditions. But something along the lines of X has a difference in relations to something else that changes intrinsically, but X does not itself change intrinsically. So it has to do with extrinsic relations to something else. That yep. other thing is changing, and there's a sort of difference in relations that, that the, the X stands in, to the other thing. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you have any maybe better necessary and sufficient conditions. I mean, I don't know. That's, that's my first rough go. No, that's, um, that's, that's pretty close to the standard account. So I'm right now I'm in Scotland. And so I'm north of the Cambridge Divinity Faculty. Uh, if, if it were legal at the moment, it's not, uh, I could get on train and go down to, to Cambridge. Uh, so, so yeah, normally I could do that. So I could go down to Cambridge. So, and then I could stand to the south of the Cambridge Divinity Faculty building. And so you could say, well, look, um, it's changed in the sense of, you know, being south of Ryan to now being north of Ryan. Why is it changed in that sense? Well, because I moved. The building didn't move at all, but I moved. So the building's not changed intrinsically. It's just changed relationally. Well, that's fine. But that still marks moments in the life of the building because the building was once such a way where it was south of Ryan and then all of a sudden becomes such that it's, you know, north of Ryan. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's a clear change. And so that's why you because, gotta, yeah. And so that's why you're going to have someone like Augustine go, we need to say that God's not really related to the universe because you, that's still a change. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, 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 do, I do share the intuition that, like, even if there's a Cambridge change, you're still going from being related in such a way to being related into a different way, you know? So that it seems as though there's a, a sort of transition there, going like a succession mm-hmm. almost, as it were. Yes. Um, and, like, all our examples of Cambridge changes, whether it's, like, a father going from being taller than his son to being shorter than his son because his son is growing, you know, yep. or, like, the positional changes that you said, like, all of these are such that the thing which Cambridge changes... Um, has succession in its life. And again, yep. it's like almost precisely because it has succession that it is able to undergo such changes from exactly. uh, being related in such and such a way to being related in such a, another way. Um, yeah, so that's so why immutability, that so this is why immutability says God cannot undergo any intrinsic or extrinsic changes because someone like Peter Lombard is going, oh gosh, yeah, if God even undergoes extrinsic changes, then he's going to undergo succession and we can't have that because then we don't have timelessness. So that's okay. that's why the, it's, it's really important to see how strong the cl- the actual classical tradition uh, is, not a contemporary internet uh, classical theist. Yeah, oh, because, I guess yeah, another way strange. to think about. Hmm. So go go, uh, oh, no. yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say because like I know uh, like Edward Fazer brought up Cambridge changes when you guys had your like Theopolis mm-hmm. dialogue. So it's like a lot of the classical theists that I hear from like use this Cambridge change notion a lot when like trying to yeah. make sense of these things. So it's uh, like, I don't know. Yeah. It, they're using it in ways that at times just don't even look like Cambridge changes anymore. So when we're talking about like actions, the actions that God performs, those cannot be Cambridge changes because actions are intrinsic to agents. That's something an agent does. So trying to use that in terms to try to explain creation, that, that's, that, is, that is just a category mistake. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then further, it's just ignoring all of the many, many statements from all the major classical thinkers who say those don't apply to God either. So I... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand like what, what's all the big deal about why even bringing it up? Because I'm like, we've already denied it of God in the classical tradition. So if we're talking about the God of classical theism, why are you even talking about Cambridge changes? It's, it's irrelevant. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I have a, I have another thing on the that point, but I, Joe, if you want to go back, we need to talk about Cambridge changes more after we finish that. I have something else, mm-hmm. but we need to. Yeah, do you have anything else, Joe, on the Cambridge change? Because I, I, I hear it referenced a lot. Um, but yeah, it, it, when they do, like, I know, like, when Phaser has used it a couple times, it's exactly what you say. It's like, what? Like, obviously, when God's doing something, he's having to act, and it, it doesn't make any sense to say that's extrinsic. But, Joe, do you have anything else on trying to pin down that definition or on that whole thing there? Because I, I, um, I know that was, like, a lot of our a lot of our thoughts on these mm-hmm. points as we're going to get into. Yeah. So. Um, I guess another way to think about it is just to, like, let's, like, let's say that, okay, maybe... Let's just suppose that X can undergo a Cambridge change, but yet still lack succession. So let's just suppose that. So I don't know how to suppose that, thing, immutable thing. <laughs> This <laughs> well, is the problem. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I'm j- so go ahead, go ahead, go no, ahead. No, yeah. I'm actually trying to, build, I'm, I'm trying to tease out a problem for this view. So yeah. let's just suppose okay. like for reductio, I guess I mm-hmm. should have said for reductio. Sure. Um, let's suppose for reductio that that could be the case. Well, then like. How can we individuate its standing in the one relation from its standing in the other relation? Right. So it's like, um, I guess, I guess like what's, what accounts for how it can stand in that one relation and stand in the other. Relation. Cause you know, like when we're talking about me and like my son, who's going from being shorter than me to being taller than me, like, mm-hmm. you know, like we can, we can distinguish those relations that I stand in precisely in virtue of different times that mm-hmm. I'm in. Um, yeah. you know, so like, I, I guess it's like, we need some sort of principle of individuation between the relations that accounts for how it can be the case that these relations are different, but if it's right. timeless, you know, like if it's timeless and immutable, like where's that principle of individuation, you know, like how do we not just collapse these relational distinctions just into one relation that it stands in, you know, like wh- what, mm-hmm. what accounts for its distinction if it's not succession? So I guess right. like, I guess that's even a, a different way to think about it, like in terms mm-hmm. of individuation. Yes, because typically when we're individuating like these sorts of things, we would say that like a moment is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. And a change is things uh, having incompatible properties at different times or different moments. So things are one way. They've got like whatever properties they are. At the next moment, they're a different way. They've got incompatible properties. And so in order to avoid having any sort of contradiction of you having incompatible properties at the same moment, you know, we've got two different moments there. And that's what distinguishes it. How are you going to get all of that built into a single timeless moment? I don't know. Like, Like it seems impossible. 
Yeah, I think that I think that what Joe said there touches on what I was thinking because when you give those examples, I was like, okay, yeah, but we're so we're using we're talking about Cambridge changes and like obviously a building. It's so obviously if Ryan, if you're like walking around the building, then that requires temporal succession for the building mm-hmm. to have a Cambridge change. So my initial yep. thought was like, well, maybe all of our like thought experiments like about defining Cambridge changes are like analogies, but it's not necessarily the case that all of them require temporal succession. Like maybe we're just talking about that. Mm -hmm. But then I think as you guys talk about this, that was my initial thought, but maybe we can kind of do sort of like what Felipe does or what we talk about with like Oppie's causal principle or other causal Mm -hmm. principles. We can sort of just say that like, it's almost like abductively, like this makes more sense to like generalize this premise about temporality. So that's kind of how I think about, I've thought about it generally. Uh Of course, the classical theists are just going to say something like, they're going to be like, yeah, but when you talk about Cambridge changes, you're talking about, because we can only think and talk in temporal moments but like obviously when this applies to god it's just an analogous there but in reality these cambridge changes you know because god's not like a building so they're going to have all these relevant distinctions but so did you have something joe i know you're yeah yeah no no it's like i i think that's a really good thing to keep in mind it's just like like sure i might not be able to like decisively and with certitude demonstrate that x is standing in different cambridge relations requires succession but it's like you know like we can think sense. in terms of a Morian shift. We can think in terms mm-hmm. of a Morian shift, right? So, like, one man's modus ponens, or one person's, I guess I should be, <laughs> one <Sure>. person's <laughs> modus ponens is another person's modus tollens, right? So it's just like, sh- okay, like, you're giving me this 50-step proof, proof, Dr. Phaser. Um, mm-hmm. Like, but I have this, I have this thing that really seems almost evident to me that Cambridge changes require succession. It's like, right. okay, well, here's one hand and here's another. I mean, I'm just going to do a modus tollens version and mm-hmm. instead of your modus ponens version, right? You know, I, right. I, I just think that's a good move that we should keep in mind, that we have to, yeah. we have to weigh these things. I mean, it's, the classical mm-hmm. piece like, might be able to have like, an internally consistent position, but it's like we have this very, very heavy weight on this side. Yeah, so I think I think the problem is actually even more difficult than just this. So all so it is the case all of the Cambridge changes I'm aware of involve temporal succession, mm-hmm. but I want to say it's even stronger than that. So all the all the to talk about change in general just is to say things are one way at one time and then differently at the next time. That's just what a change is. What could it possibly mean to say there's a timeless change? And this is important because the classical theist, their definitions of impassive, or I'm sorry, not impassibility, immutability and timelessness presuppose that this is true because they want to say, why is God unchanging? Because he's timeless. If God changed, he'd be temporal. If he changed intrinsically or extrinsically, he'd be temporal. And so they're assuming the very truth of this idea that change involves being one way and then another way. So if they want to reject that and say, well, there's, there's other ways you could talk about a timeless change. Well, then all of the arguments, all of the reasons, all the rationality undergirding timelessness and immutability, those go out the window. And I have no idea what we're going to say at that point. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, I had, man, I just thought of something, but I forgot it because, <laughs> <laughs> darn it, because that's the point, because that's what I was thinking. I was like, I already know what the response to this is going to be, but I'm not sure it works, which is why we <laughs> need to to talk about it. oh yeah, the other thing i was going to say i don't know if we this might be going too into the weeds but like i don't know if we need to because a couple of your problems we'll be talking about say that um you know like god changes from being in this state to being in this state yep so i mean since we've talked about like cambridge changes well let's briefly define like real changes like what then mm. does it mean to say that god changes from x to y state um, since it's not a, it, it's, so I guess we're saying Cambridge relations aren't like a good model. So we can like maybe mm-hmm. put this in a way of like, you know, contrasting models like theoretically. So we can say well, we have yeah. the Cambridge change model, and it seems like that has some problems accounting for staying internally consistent with timelessness. So an alternative model of how God changes in this relation has to like have some different conception of what it means for God to change in relation to something. So right. I don't know if you wanted to tease out at all like what you how you like to think about that or, or something. Yeah. So I, I get, well, I guess in general, I, I just think that the, all the, all the move to Cambridge change is just ignoring the fact that the classical theist has already said these do not apply to God. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to go, this is a non-starter. Um, but the intrinsic changes are, those are the ones that are interesting. And those are the ones that classical theists are really trying to figure out how do we get rid of? Cause the, the Cambridge changes, they're just like, well, God's not really related to the universe. So there we go. We can get rid of all of the intrinsic like or extrinsic uh, changes from that. But the intrinsic changes, I'm like, those seem like, how are you going to get, well, it's already implausible to say God's not related to the universe, but how are you going to explain away intrinsic changes? So the ways that God seems like he changes in himself. 
So the, the like the next way like to look at this is to say it looks like when you're talking about creation ex nihilo, you've got this pre-creation moment. It looks like God changes from not causing anything to exist to causing a universe to exist. It seems like God's doing nothing and then he's doing like stuff. And so that seems like that's a really clear change. You've got you could talk in terms like of like potency to actuality, you know, like you know, there's a lot of ways you could cut it. Not acting to acting. And that seems really obvious. But yeah, the classical theist is going to have a, a response that they're going to say, well, God doesn't change in that way because he's pure actuality. So God's always causing the universe to exist because he doesn't change okay. from not causing to causing. He just has to be eternally causing. Yeah. Well, because my, my other that, that kind of bleeds a little bit into my question. One of my other questions on problem mm -hmm. two or on the one that says uh, to tease it out again is that mm -hmm. God changes from being alone to existing with the universe. And mm -hmm. so this made me think of um, the doctrine of like divine aseity, which is not necessarily like an explicitly classical theist thing. It's the kind of more general, I'm mean, not all classical, like obviously open theists wouldn't affirm it about like all, no, all knowing. But I just thought of like, you know, maybe maybe divine aseity can help the classical theist here or whatever other theist this may be a problem for. And mm -hmm. just saying like, well, God and all of his attributes are like, you know, radically independent. So his act of and we'll talk a little about this more because I had a similar point on the omnipresence mm -hmm. um, point, but just saying like, well, God is independently, radically, necessarily, you know, um, all good, all knowing, like all this stuff. So yeah, like all of these intrinsic properties, like they don't change once there's a universe because God is, you know, radically independent from anything that mm -hmm. happens external to him. So even if yeah. there's like this kind of temporal succession, so maybe it just they can even bite the bullet and say there still requires time but we can still have like these essay but i don't know does the sadie help the classical theist there or do we still just have the same problems? no because i think what yeah. um what happens here is is pretty common that people are sneaking in simplicity into aseity uh like uh so there's a lot of arguments a lot of actually most of the arguments have been published in the last like five years for simplicity from aseity actually build simplicity into the definition of uh, aseity and i'm just like why would you do that? So here's what aseity traditionally means. It means that God's existence is not dependent upon nor derived from anything else. So his is existence. Self-sufficiency is a different claim. It's the claim that uh, God's uh, like perfect nature, whatever his essential attributes are, they are not dependent on or derived from something else outside of himself. So then you start saying, well, okay, well which attributes does God have? What are the essential ones? And we can say omniscience, omnipotence, whatever. Omnipotence is a great one omnipotency it's potential right there the potential the power to do a whole bunch of stuff uh well okay can you have omnipotence without exercising that power can you have a power without exercising the power seems like yeah that's obvious because why well look at me like so you guys could probably tell that i work out a lot you know like i can easily bench press about like 500 pounds it's like quite <laughs> I'm not going to demonstrate it to you because I don't feel like it and I've got free will so I'm just going right. to you know refrain from doing it but I still have the power to do that though uh, but I have that power regardless of whether or not I'm exercising it. And so you can say the same thing about all of God's omni properties. God's all powerful. God's all knowing, uh, or you could say maybe he's got like maximal cognitive excellency or something like that. He can have those powers without exercising them. And that's why this, this, this particular problem that we're looking at is where it looks like God's not causing and then causing nothing about all is going to help with that because you can get all self-sufficiency and say, God just essentially and necessarily has all this power. But that doesn't mean he has to actualize it. I don't know if that, does that make sense or should I like say it differently? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense to me at least. I don't know if Joe had any more questions, but that makes sense. Because it, it sounds then like on that view, you could have like sort of a lot of these passive powers and everything and, and still be fine with creation. You just still can't have the timelessness. So it's right. also a problem for the classical theist and not so for someone like you or Josh Rasmussen, whatever he is, mm -hmm. or Panantheist and anything like that. Right. So, um, yeah, I, think I mean, I, may, ben, I think they mm -hmm. they would probably appeal to um, the distinction between you know active potency and passive potency. I mean, active potency, strictly speaking, is an actuality, but it's yep. like it's like a it's like a causal power, but it's like the actuality of possessing the causal power, um, in some sense. At least that's how Phaser sort of explicates it in Scholastic Metaphysics, his book. Yep. Um, but passive potency, you know, is just like the ability to be affected by something, you know. Yep. Um, but that's so already like been rejected a, I, in impassibility. So this can't this distinction, yeah. the classical theists can make it all day long, but then the really consistent classical theists are gonna say, but this doesn't apply to God, because God doesn't have any passive potency. And then further, uh, given simplicity, someone like John Philopinus is gonna who makes this distinction goes, but in God they're the same thing, because God's simple, so everything's identical. 
So they can make these distinctions, but they don't they don't apply uh, to God. Yeah, well, passive potency certainly wouldn't under the yeah. classical theist account. But I'm wondering, like, don't they conceive of God as a sort of like pure active power, like pure actuality, yeah. which is in some sense um, pure active potency when we understand active potency as a kind yeah. of actuality. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if they're just going to say like, well, um, having a power but not exercising it still doesn't really mean or automatically entail that it has some sort of potency because um, it's a kind of actuality. I'm, I'm wondering if they're just going to say that, like, you can still have a power and not exercise it, but also be purely actual. So, you know, you get what I'm saying? I see. I could say that, but that's because I'm denying the claim that God's purely actual because uh, pure actuality means no potency whatsoever, not even in like these all these other senses. Because, as the, like the classical theist will say, to go from potentiality to actuality, even like going from having a power to exercising the power, that's a change, and that implies mutability. So you've got you've lost immutability, and then you're going to have accidental properties, and you're going to have succession. So you've lost simplicity, you've lost timelessness, you've lost the whole thing, and so they're going to be like, "Ooh, can't have that." So this pure actuality means like no potential of any sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very it's a very strong doctrine. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely getting that. Um, yeah, so we, we can go back if Joe has anything else. I, I had some comments from um, Ben Bavar. I sent him kind of what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Like He's one of the co-hosts of Real Atheology. We talked sometimes. He had some helpful comments. Um, it was funny because he, Joe, and I had like all the same comments on like two through four. We were like, these are probably like Cambridge changes, right? So it's good we're teasing all that out because we all basically yeah. said the same thing. Uh, but he said something that kind of, I mean, this sort of bleeds into the third point, which is similar to the second. It just says God changes from not causing anything to exist to um, causing a universe to exist. So it's sort of like related to the other problem of like he goes from, I guess it's more specific, though, because instead of it's just like, oh, there's God and the universe pops into existence. It's like, well, he goes from being God to being God, the creator. Yeah. Um, but one of Ben's comments on like these kind of problems was like, uh like saying that one might say, like one could say that God has been creating from all eternity without denying that God exists alone. So his already creating like before time doesn't entail that the universe itself exists before time. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also said like there's no outright contradiction in saying that God is always causing the universe and at some point the universe doesn't yet exist. So this might have, he said, oh, this might have yep. implications for like hierarchical creation, creation but there's no like yeah, outright that's contradiction what in saying that. That's mm -hmm. what Christopher Tomachevsky said in my blog post for, I think it was problem eight, I think, that mm -hmm. I mentioned in the, the blog post. And, you know, he was talking about how, well, and then he even cited Aquinas from the Summa Contra Gentiles, I think, where um, God acts eternally, but his effect is such that it's temporal. So maybe you can speak right. to that uh, in relation yeah. to this problem. Yeah. So one of the things I'm doing in uh, some longer versions of, of, of these papers that I'm working on is to look at this argument and go, how does the classical theist try to get out of it and they make this move that exactly what you said they're like well god eternally causes these things but they just kind of temporarily come into existence and you're like okay cool there's a couple of things you could do one you could say you could go swinburne and say it seems like causes are always temporally prior to their effects and the classical theist has to get rid of that and so you can be like well you're getting rid of a really really intuitive causal principle so that seems weird this doesn't seem good here's another thing you could do though when you look at the doctrine of the trinity the doctrine of the Trinity uh, has this claim that God the Father uh, causes God the Son to exist. Uh, and and it's, so it's an eternal cause with an eternal effect. And what it entails is that the Son is begotten, which is a causal claim, and not made or created, which is also a different kind of causal claim. The created or made is come into existence. Um, begotten is a cause that could be eternal. The underlying principle here is this. Eternal causes can have eternal effects. And that's right there in the Doctrine of the Trinity. And they'll say, uh, you know, if, if something has a, a you know, a, a temporal effect, then it's, it's going to be created like ex nihilo. So one of the things I want to try to do is try to tease out and say, look, let's look at some parallel reasoning here. So it seems plausible to me that if you have an eternal cause, you're going to have an eternal effect. And then we can see that this is exactly endorsed in the Doctrine of the Trinity. It's right there in the Creed. An eternal cause with an eternal effect is a, an absolute denial of creation ex nihilo. And that's what the eternal creation model says as well. They're like, eternal causes have eternal effects. That's why God never exists without the universe. Now, what does it mean to say that God has an eternal cause with a temporal effect? Because I know what it means to say eternal cause with an eternal effect, but I don't know how to mix, mix and match these. And there's been no answer in the Christian tradition to this question. It's just like, it, other than, it just does. 
And you're like, how? It seems like eternal causes have to have eternal effects. And that's what so many people who reject the Christian uh, tradition, uh, who affirm eternal creation, say, no, that's nuts. That makes no sense. So this is like Proclus' uh, objection to John Philoponus. So John Philoponus affirms creation ex nihilo, and he wants to say God just declares the universe comes into existence when it does. And Proclus goes, that makes no sense. Eternal acts from an eternal God have to have eternal effects. That just seems way more obvious. What are you talking about where God's eternally creating, but this universe just doesn't eternally come into existence? Explain how that works. And there's no explanation. So you can say okay. it just does. And that's fine. But it seems like I've got some much more plausible claims over here of eternal causes have eternal effects. And temporal causes have temporal effects. How do you get an eternal cause with a temporal effect? Tell me that. That's what I want to know. And nobody's answered that question. Yeah. See, I get, I get the mystery. So I, I totally have the sense of mystery. Now, I'm wondering... I'm wondering if I can bridge that to a sense of incoherence. So, like, you know, it's like it does strike me as strange. Right, that's all this is like. <laughs> but, it's weird. But, but, but it's like, right. it's weird, you know, but it's like I'm trying to tease out whether or not. Well, yeah, you know, so my, can... my goal today is just to go, let's make this look as implausible as possible. Like, I can, like, point out contradictions in other ways, but this one I just, like, this particular argument that I'm running is just go, let's just heap on all the implausibility that we can to make the view look as unattractive as possible. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's like your, your intent, like, the, uh, yeah. the intent of the argument isn't necessarily, for, for this one at least, isn't yes. necessarily to demonstrate some sort of incoherence, but to, to point out that this is a counterintuitive or strange result. And yes. that at least seems to be a sort of theoretical vice of certain yes. uh, yeah. accounts. Okay. Yeah. I think it's like, it's like what we talked I, about with Cambridge changes. Like they may have an account of like timeless Cambridge changes, but like it just, it seems really weird, right? It's like they may have yeah. an answer or sure that's like internally really coherent in a way, but it's just like, but given all this other evidence and every thought experiment we think of, it's like, this just looks really strange. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I think that works for like a lot of these. It's like, you probably could explain that. You're just going to have to like deny some really plausible, like alternative views. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, I think importantly that though, importantly, is important. importantly, but that's also not going to be the case for all of them. So I don't want someone to, to yeah. listen to this be like, okay, well then all of your criticisms for classical theism are just that it's strange. It's like no, right. we also right. have some arguments that seek at least seek to demonstrate some sort of internal incoherence or incompatibility. Right. So yes. there are these different different brands. So exactly. uh, yeah. we're not we're not. Just for the audience, yeah. we're not claiming that yeah. all of the problems so are like, only just strange or intuitive. Right, yeah. Which I think we'll probably have something that looks like that when we talk about the causal principle argument, because I want to mm -hmm. use that to bridge a conversation into some other causal principles, so probably like the difference principle. Um, so mm -hmm. when, once we talk about yeah. causal principles, we'll, we'll get more to like outright contradictions. But yeah, I'm trying, I'm like Joe here. I, like, I get like the sort of like just intuitive kind of like, mm, yeah, that's weird, but... I. Because every time, like, I see, like, a problem like this come up for classical theists and I read, like, the, you know, like, the message boards, like, for the Thomas, mm -hmm. it's always the same thing. It's like, well, this person just doesn't understand Aquinas. Obviously, sure. it's, like, a conceptual problem or, like, they'll say something. They'll, it's always something along the lines of what I said earlier. They're like, well, obviously, but Cambridge changes don't have to be like this for God. And so, you know, I know what all the responses are going to look like, generally speaking, but um, I'm trying to think of, like, good responses to give well phaser's response like, from that. phaser's response is actually um well like yeah sure these are he actually agrees that it's it's a little strange but he says this is just a sort of necessary result of my metaphysical demonstrations um, right yeah yeah so yeah. That, that's his his like his he says like yeah sure i mean it might be weird to have a cause which causes something a change in its effect without itself undergoing a change in doing so but that's just the result of my argument like that's just an entailment of the argument right. and so you have to pinpoint a premise in my argument which is false because that's just a consequence of it um which i mean it's like okay but it's like first of all i mean I doubt that this is a metaphysical demonstration with as much certainty as you think it is. Um, there are sure. lot, lots of very questionable premises. And we also have the sort of Morian shift, like, here are two hands, bro. Um, mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's one way you can go. Yeah. I had a cup. Have you, did you say anything else, Ryan? But maybe, yeah, no, maybe, no, no, no. maybe you could speak to that method. Like, um, just like, oh, well, listen, yeah, yeah. I have this demonstration. That oh, class yeah. yeah. So it's just a um, consequence. You know, like... So when I look through like uh, like some of like Phaser's arguments for the existence of God, there's a bunch of principles in there that I want to say those I just think are false or I think they're implausible. But some of the other ones, I, I think some of them I think you can demonstrate are false as well. If you and talking in terms of like, say, like the consistency of uh, uh, like a Christian doctrine of God and 
So, so for example, um, you get this claim that like uh, God's simple, so God can't have any any properties whatsoever, can't be in a real relation with anything, uh, can't have any forms, you know, all these sorts of things. And they're like, okay, well, what about the incarnation? Seems like uh, the, the person, <laughs> well, the Trinity, like, I mean, yeah, I just don't think you can, you, I think it's impossible to get a Trinity, any meaningful sense of a Trinity with simplicity, but nobody really cares about those sorts of arguments. So I usually set those aside. Uh, so the incarnation, though, the claim is that the person, God, the son, the one person gets properties from the divine nature and the human nature. But if it's really a simple person that can't have any properties, then you're not going to be able to get the properties from, from human nature. So I'm like, that's just impossible. Further, someone like Aquinas and others are going to say, God, the son is not really related to his human nature. And I'm like, well, then how are you going to get a hypostatic union? Because what's the difference yeah. between me and Jesus? Uh, Jesus seems like he's pretty cool. Well, I'm pretty cool. God's not really related to him. God's not really related to me. Okay, then what's this hypostatic union? What's all this incarnation stuff? God's not related. It, it to makes anything. the relation inexplicable, right? Like, yes. it, well, it, not really inexplicable, but inexplicable as to why he stands in that relation to Jesus as opposed to me or you or someone else. If he stands right. in no real relation to any of us, right? Exactly. There's no more particular reason to focus on Jesus than any other individual if there are no real relations. Yeah. There's so also I think no it, reason to send Jesus in the first place if there's no real relations of like sin, fall, all that. Like this doesn't even. <sighs> They, I think what, what I want to do, what I would have done elsewhere uh, is focus on impassibility, this claim that God can't have any influences outside of himself mm -hmm. and he's in a state of pure and disturbed happiness. And so trying to kind of point out like, well, this God couldn't have any reasons to do anything because it doesn't change anything about like, why, like, why would you act? So I think this can undermine arguments for like any cosmological argument and then also any sort of argument for sending a son. But that's a different, that's a different topic for a different day. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say it as some interesting. Yeah, so I, I remember I had some notes here, but I think we've pretty much um, gone through it. What did I say? I was like, for one thing, I was I was talking thought about um like the distinction we may have between like something being eternal and something being timeless, and kind of where mm -hmm. that distinction might be important. Um, but also, what did I say here? Oh yeah, I think that's kind of the point we covered. But I was like basically saying like, could God be eternally creating a universe that wasn't itself eternal? But you kind of addressed that with like eternal cause and eternal effects. Because I was thinking right. like maybe God could eternally be creating like an initial like what um Trent Doherty called like an initial world segment or mm -hmm. like an additional. But that gets into like presentism and eternalism and which one theist might affirm. Because I know some classical theists or people who tend that way, like Alex Proust or eternalists or Trent Doherty. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of others like Fazer are hardcore presentists. So. Um, I don't know if we should, I don't know if that's relevant at all, like the change, like the time and change. If it is, we can talk about it a little bit. Let's, but. let's talk, about, yeah, let's talk a bit about that um, because it'll help you understand some moves that they'll make to some of these other arguments. So, so the big, the, like the big hope it's supposed to get is like, you've got this claim that I'm, that I'm making is you've got this pre-creation moment where God exists without a universe and then he exists, exists with a universe and you can start identifying all these ways it seems God changed. It seems like he goes from not doing anything to doing something. Um, you know, uh, from not having any like causal relations to having a bunch of causal relations from not having accidental properties of being the creator to having the accidental property of being the creator. If you adopt eternalism, uh, the claim from like Paul Helm, Catherine Rogers, TJ Mawson, it's very explicit. There is no state of affairs where God exists without the universe. God and the universe are co-eternal. And so then all the problems that I've been pointing out from this pre-creation moment, they all go away. But here's the problem. Have you really have creation ex nihilo anymore? Because the entire classical tradition, they said what distinguishes creation ex nihilo from eternal creation is this pre existence state of uh, this, like, you know, this non, uh, there's no, there's God and nothing else. Like, that's what's supposed to distinguish eternal creation from creation ex nihilo. And if you adopt eternalism, you've lost that. And so I'm like, well, I don't know how to distinguish eternal creation now from creation ex nihilo. And I can point out a whole bunch of panentheists, a bunch of process theists, a bunch of whole people who are going to say, right, you've given up creation ex nihilo. You finally affirm what we affirm. You know, welcome home, brother. And it's like, well, okay, well, but they're giving up the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. So you, this, you can't have views that look exactly identical to someone else who completely rejects your, your doctrine. That doesn't make any sense. Right. I, I guess that's where, like, the distinction I was thinking of between, I, I was thinking of, like, the timelessness and eternal distinction was most mm -hmm. applicable here because, you know, maybe it's, because maybe that doesn't follow, right? Like, maybe it's like, well, God can, there can be, like, an eternalist universe that God creates, but since God's timeless, he's not, like, eternally coexistent with it. Like, maybe there's mm -hmm. just, uh, like, an earlier, because we talked about this a little bit earlier, like, maybe there are 
states of succession or just states of affairs that aren't temporal. So maybe if God's like timeless, there's a way in which he can produce this block universe in like a creative moment. But it, so it's not like the universe exists eternally along with him, because not only is he eternal on the classical theist model, he's timeless, which so I guess my the question I had boiled down to, like, is there a distinction meaningfully between timelessness and eternality that the classical theist could draw to, like, maybe help with some of these problems? Like, maybe a classical mm -hmm. theist who's an eternalist can be like, well, the universe does exist eternally in the sense we understand eternal time, but God's timeless. So it, it's not the case that for him, every moment is coexistent with this universe. So I don't know if that helps at all, but or if that was clear. Uh, enough, I think I understand the issue, at least. So. So it, eter eternity, eternal natures, or you know, eternal beings, they are beings that exist without beginning and without end. Um, but to get timelessness, you need to add the further claims of without succession, without temporal location, without temporal extension, and so on. Uh, so, so like I would say, I would say like God's an eternal being um, because he exists without beginning, without end, but he has succession. All right. And we're talking about an eternalist ontology of time. The claim is that whatever moments of time that they exist they just do exist full stop and they exist in their successive ordering relations of earlier than and later than and so on but they just do exist none ever come into existence none ever like cease to exist and so that's why like paul helm tj moss and Catherine rogers are going to say you've got god plus the universe and it, because because none of these things are coming into or going out of existence so the the, the, the block as a whole just eternally exists in this much stronger sense so you could say there's a moment where, like, I guess you could put a temporal moment at the at the first stage of the of the block of time, where there's nothing, um, just an empty moment. But you'd still have all the other moments existing too, with God. So that wouldn't really help okay. you get, yeah. Uh, okay, further, that helps. yeah. So further is like really like drive this point home. Um, so when we talk, we're going to talk about omnipresence in a minute. So I want to say it looks like God goes from not being omnipresent to being omnipresent. And this view would say, well, you would never have God not being omnipresent to the universe because he's always omnipresent. What does that mean? Omnipresence means God is causally sustaining everything that exists. So he's like present by power and he knows all the stuff that exists. So he's there by knowledge. And you cannot be omnipresent to things you're not causally sustaining in existence because that's part of the very definition of omnipresence. So if you've got an eternal block there existing, God's omnipresent fully to it. So you never have God not being present to, these, to the block. Okay. Yeah. That's so helpful. then, in comes, yeah. in comes the di the difficulties with with presentism and like sure. at least omnipresence in the sense of present in knowledge to them, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, if presentism is true, well, then there just doesn't there just don't exist future things, right? And if right. there don't exist future things, well, then there then you can you can like literally deductively infer that there doesn't exist an X such that X is future and X is known by God, right? Yeah. That just follows. It, I mean, yes. it just follows, and so. God can't know the future. Sim well, okay, he knows what happens in the future, but he can't like yeah. know it in terms of being like actually present to it because it doesn't actually exist. He, he can't um, know truths about the future under presentism. Um, yeah. Like temporal, temporal actualities. So like X is actual, but X is in the year 2300 um, because that, that genuinely and objectively changes in truth value. Um, yes. So like, I just think it's sort of, it's just strange. Like presentism, I mean, I, I actually think this one goes beyond strange and counterintuitive. I think you can, mounted pretty forceful argument yes um from from omniscience so maybe you can yes. talk about the difficulty yeah. of omniscience. so the omniscience one it's 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 really straightforward like you pointed out it's so like i'm just i'll assume presentism for the moment um so you've again you've got this claim where god exists without the universe uh you've got this pre-creation moment and then what's this way then it seems like god changes when the universe comes into existence it seems like god goes from knowing i alone exist to i exist with a bunch of stuff i alone exist to I am causally sustaining all these things in existence. Uh, I know that these things now exist. Like you're going to have all these sorts of like changes in God's propositional knowledge. And I'm just focusing on propositional knowledge. And it cannot be the case that God knows that I am now sustaining the year 2525 in existence because that moment just doesn't ex like that the entire year doesn't exist. None of those moments exist. So God cannot know that. Uh, so wh what does the classical tradition do though? They've got an answer to this. They'll say God just doesn't have temporal knowledge. Uh, he doesn't know what time it is now, and he doesn't know um, like you know, like uh, like what currently exists, and he doesn't know them like by knowledge by acquaintance either. Why? Because all of God's knowledge is based purely on himself, just purely introspective knowledge. Yeah, that's yeah. And so this is Augustine's move, and you see 
pretty much everyone wanting to follow it until um, just a bit before Aquinas, because then because Aquinas actually sees it, this problem and he's like, that's not going to give me enough because all of God's knowledge of of His own nature, all that gives me gives God is knowledge of what could possibly exist. Yeah, it doesn't give it, you as, knowledge as of actuality. In, imitable. Yeah, like um, Stanislaw in my blog post, he says he knows things from by knowing his essence as imitable. And that's the thing. That's possibly yeah. imitated. The yes. thing is, we're talking about actually imitated. And yes. that's something that's going to have to change under a presentist universe, the things that are actually yes. changing. Sorry to cut you off, but I got excited. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is, it's, it's big. It's, it's really important, especially if you're wanting to be a classical theist. You need to understand the tradition and like what the moves that they, they made and also the, the problems that they saw. And so within the classical tradition itself, they saw, oh, crap, this doesn't give God uh, knowledge of what actually exists. It only gives God knowledge of what possibly exists. And so you start seeing these kind of distinctions between like what they call God's natural knowledge and God's free knowledge. And then you get the middle knowledge stuff that, that some people like with uh, Molinism. All of that is based on this realization that if God has purely introspective knowledge, it doesn't give him knowledge of what actually exists. So here's the move of how you get God knowledge of what actually exists, supposedly. God knows everything that, 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 that will occur in the future because he's causally determined it. He's the one who makes it all happen. If you really like your freedom, your human freedom, then this is not going to help you. Um, if you don't really care about human freedom, then that's fine. Like, just go with this sort of like de divine determination case. But it doesn't help that much, though, because it only tells you, like, now God knows what will occur because he's causally determined it. Mm -hmm. It still wouldn't give you God know knowing what now occurs because mm -hmm. that's constantly changing. What is God doing right now? And someone like Augustine, you, I guess you go back to Augustine's claim, and Augustine says, it would just be bad if that's an imperfect kind of knowledge. So we, we don't want God to even know that sort of stuff because then he would be involved in change and that's imperfect. So it's just imperfect for God to know what time it is now. <clears throat> and that feels implausible. And then when it seems like, is it really imperfect for God to know what time it is now? Because it seems like yeah. if God's all knowing. Well, if I've got a God who's temporal and he knows what time it is now, then he knows more than this timeless God Mm, that doesn't well, seem to yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's that problem. But there's also, I mean, it seems to me that there's a difficulty involving providence, right? So like, mm -hmm. um, God, God has coordinated activities in the world. Yes. In, order to, in, in, in order to have those coordinated activities in the world, you need to know what actually exists. Yes. But under presentism, like, that is something that is continually changing. So you can't have this sort of like only knowing what will be the case. You can't only know the B series relations uh, right. without knowing the a series relations in order to have your providence, right? So like God yes. would still have to know like when when am I gonna send my son to become incarnate, right? Like I'm gonna have to do that in like zero AD or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, like he has to know what's actual in order to do that. Like you're completely yes. collapsing providence if you get rid of um the the knowledge of temporal actualities as they are actual, as they are now, like things like that. Right. So so the move for from contemporary classical theists, what they'll want to do is say, like, right, if I've got like this B series and this A series. I need to know the A series to know what's happening now. Uh, well, what do I do? I'll just get rid of the A series entirely. Uh, and I'll just affirm just the eternalist ontology of time. I'll just affirm, affirm the B theory of time and get rid of all these tense propositions. So God doesn't know the tense propositions. Why? Because then, then, you know, there's nothing there to know. What time is it now? There's no, there's no fact of the matter what time it is now. And so they'll get rid of that. Um, but then I, you've got this claim again where you've got God and the eternal block, co, co, or called co-eternal. And then I lose my grasp on how are you not affirming eternal creation? How are you actually affirming creation ex nihilo? Because it doesn't look like creation ex right. nihilo anymore. That's, yeah, because that was my thing. I was like going to say, well, yeah, this seems like it's it's fine. Then move for the eternalist. You know, God can have like tense this knowledge. But then that gets back to the problems we already talked about. Um, right. Joe, I'm well, sure you'll and there's just stuff. And there's just the problem of like the detensor project. I mean, it's like, yes. I think like I think there's like somewhat of a consensus. I mean, I'm not sure. But like you can't reduce tenseless. Uh, you can't reduce no. tense propositions to tenseless ones satisfactorily, all of them at least. You, I right. mean, I, I would make that claim. I mean, I know William Lane Craig defends this, Edward Fraser defends this, Josh Rasmussen defends this. A lot of even eternalists defend this as well. Yes. Um, so I don't, it's plausible to me, yeah. Yeah, I don't know anybody who's still working on the detensor project. Like, most people yeah. gave that up in the <laughs> it's 80s. pretty much. Yeah, so, like, when I was born, a lot of people are going, oh, crap, we got to get rid of this. Um, and so when you, <laughs> by the time you guys were born, like, I don't know who would be still working on this, except for people mm -hmm. who just aren't up to date on philosophy of time, which is fair enough, because philosophy of time is really hard to keep up with. But, but yeah, like, uh, the right. detensor project, that's, that's pretty much declared as dead. Yeah, interesting. No, yeah, because I, I think the other thing I was going to say, Joe, I know you'll have some stuff to say on this, because you've written about it. But we because we talked about this a while ago because some people's 
like William Lane Craig actually makes this move, but he makes it in a completely different context, right? Because he's, of course, not like a classical theist. But he, he wants to say in certain arguments that like, oh, well, God's knowledge isn't propositional. So like there's no problem in saying, you know, God knows this proposition at this time than the other. Because the God's knowledge isn't propositional. Um, so we could talk about that a little bit. Because Joe and I, I remember we talked about this, that you were just like, I don't know what that even means. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That's just weird. We're just yeah. like, I mean, yeah, I have, I have two. I mean, that's a good point to bring up because I think Stanislaw brought that up in my blog post. Mm. I mean, I'm not trying to like name names or anything. Like sure, I have sure. so much respect for these dudes. Like he's super, super cool guy. Um, but like there, I mean, first of all, there's that problem. It's like, I mean, what do you even mean, bro? Like, I don't even know what you mean. Like, yeah, I mean, knowledge. I really knowledge, knowledge, no way. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about knowledge by acquaintance, like, let's just use as an example. It's still mm -hmm. going to be the case that you can't be acquainted with something that doesn't exist, right? So even yes. under presentism, like the future, God can't know it by acquaintance and non-propositionally because it doesn't exist, right? You can't know something that doesn't exist. And this is what Josh Rasmussen was was also emphasizing in, in on Facebook on our comments. It's just like, yeah, sure, even, even, even if we allow that it's non-propositional knowledge, even mm -hmm. if there are different modes of knowledge in this manner, there's still it's still the case under presentism that there does not exist an x such that x is future like that yep. and that that, that I, it seems to me that that just does away with it but yeah because yeah. craig's craig's context for that claim was also with presentism i believe because i remember hearing about it when with alex malpass one of his interviews about like the kalam and craig and craig just talking about like god's knowledge being like past infinite or future infinite it's like oh it's not it's not a problem because it's god's knowledge isn't propositional and it's like and then the classical theist, well, it's it's probably one of the only cases we'll see where, like, Thomas have unity with William Lane Craig on God is, <laughs> is, is this kind of thing about, like, his knowledge not being propositional. But, I, yeah, I, I share the intuition I, there that, like... Yeah, you know. I do, too, because I don't know... I don't even know how to articulate, like, William Lane Craig's Molinism anymore if I get rid of God's propositional knowledge. Because, like, like I, I think the best yeah. way to try to articulate... I mean, it, foreknowledge in general but also like molinism in particular is like propositionally so i just don't i don't even know how to articulate those doctrines anymore if i get rid of propositional knowledge from god and that's that just seems that seems like a very serious problem to me yeah that's that's a good one it was good to bring up but yeah it's just so problematic yeah. like presentism and knowledge so that has ramifications for the kalam too but mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm trying to see what else we had here so, there were a so, couple yeah so there's one more kind of objection that like i well i guess there's oh, yeah, one yeah. more and then there's this oppie causal principle that uh, we haven't really yes. talked about yet uh yeah. so the, the the final and i know you guys want to get to that uh because yeah, yes. we're good grandma he's brilliant so like, yeah i love it um so the final kind of way i think god changes in knowledge would be phenomenal knowledge uh so phenomenal knowledge uh, or what's called like experiential knowledge or it's knowledge of something that it's like so like right now i'm kind of hungry and i really want a delectable cheeseburger and and like and so i've got this desire this hope for this sort of thing and and like when i come to eat the cheeseburger like you could say like there's this proposition ryan is eating the cheeseburger but that's different from like the actual experience of what it's like to eat a cheeseburger and so most people mm -hmm. will say this 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 phenomenal knowledge this experiential knowledge it is not reducible to propositional knowledge like that's a pretty standard uh, claim within contemporary philosophy mm -hmm. it seems to me that there is something that it is like to create a universe <laughs> And this is not like knowledge that God could have in the pre-creation moment. So if you've got God existing alone in all, like his you know solitary glory, like uh, Arthur W. Pink wants to say, and then God existing with all this other stuff, it seems like God should undergo some kind of experiential change. He doesn't know what it's like to, ex to experience creating a universe out of nothing, and then he does. And that's a really important kind of knowledge that you can't have that's not reducible to propositional knowledge. You can only have that by undergoing the experience itself. And it just, and if the creation ex nihilo says universe begins to exist and God never has, does not begin to exist. So there's, you know, it's not co-eternal with God then God cannot uh, like co-eternally have this experiential knowledge. The universe is quite literally not uh, an eternal object for God to eternally experience you know, on the traditional doctrine of creation ex nihilo. So it seems just like there's this clear change in God. Mm. Yeah, this one I yeah. found interesting. And I remember my only note I took down on it was about like eternalism. But we've mm -hmm. already like covered that, or at least the only one I found. But there was one, I actually forgot to mention this a second ago about the knowledge point, but the, a couple other comments I got from Ben Bavar mm -hmm. uh, were about the propositional knowledge, but also relating to this. And we've, we've kind of covered all this already with Cambridge changes, but basically there was a paper he recommended by Matthews Grant that defended the idea that God's knowledge is an extrinsic relation. Yeah, so changes in God's in knowledge. Yeah, it's yeah, like changes in God's knowledge. Would be... yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So then he, for point seven, he was like, 
you know, he thought of, he said, well, maybe seven, maybe phenomenal experience is also an extrinsic relation the same way propositional knowledge mm. is. But it kind of seems implausible to me to say that like phenomenal experience of something is an extrinsic relation. I guess it's like, yeah, yeah my That's it, your intrinsic like, no, mental if, state. Right. Yeah. So there's no it doesn't really make sense to me. That was the point you brought up, which I thought was interesting. And it was interesting yeah. with the it was interesting with the propositional knowledge point, but I, we've talked about that so much. It's like these kind of Cambridge relations are yeah, so counterintuitive. I wanted to, I want to like kind of explain like how counterintuitive this really is, though. So this claim yeah. that God's action is extrinsic, I don't know what that could possibly mean. Like in the Peter Van Wagen sense of like, I don't know what that could possibly mean. Uh, like it doesn't seem like it has any actual sense to it. And I want to say the same thing about phenomenal knowledge or knowledge in general. I don't know what it means to say that's an, an extrinsic relation. But here's where the classical theist, like why I don't think it would help them. Because remember, the classical theist says God doesn't undergo any, any extrinsic changes uh, or intrinsic mm, changes, right. and God's not really related to the universe. So if God's phenomenal knowledge or his actions or things are supposed to be a relationship between God and the universe, well, but God's not really related to the universe. So what are you even talking about? Right. If you want to go that way and say, well, maybe God really is related to the universe, so I can have my extrinsic knowledge or an extrinsic action, whatever that is, then you've given up all your answers to the previous objections that we've looked at. So you right. could take this move, but then you lose all your responses to the previous objections. And that's a really bad state to be in now, because now you have no answer to the previous objections. Yeah, so I mean, you say here that like this is not a kind of knowledge that God can eternally have because the universe is not an eternal object from the eternal <laughs> experience. Yep. And of course, you know, maybe eternalists would deny that, but we've covered some of that already. Right. Um, yeah, like something that it is likeness to create a universe. I mean, the classical, the, the answer that Thomas and classical theists are going to give is obviously they're, you know, we talked about a seity. So they're going to say something along the lines of, um, you know, well, God's identical to his knowledge. He's identical to like his actions. So obviously mm -hmm. God is, but then saying God's identical, identical to a certain like phenomenal experience of creating, like he's identical to the experience that it is to be creating something is as with everything, like that's what they're going to say, but it seems counterintuitive. Right. Um, but they probably will deny that God has like phenomenal experiences, right? Cause they will say that like, maybe that requires succession. And I can see you know, some so internet, uh, like Thomas saying this, but they're not going to be consistent with what Aquinas actually says. So if again, of course, Ooh, I know the turn tables. Get, I know, yeah. right. Um, trying to get people to be uh, consistent with their own views. Um, so actually, if you look at the whole classical tradition, so just ignore Aquinas, like everybody else will say this too. Uh, so impassibility, remember impassibility, I said, God cannot have any emotion that is inconsistent with perfect rationality, uh, perf uh, perfect uh, like uh, moral goodness, and perfect happiness. And, and so the classical tradition, Aquinas included, will say, God is in a state of pure, undisturbed bliss. It's like this a great, amazing experience of happiness. And it's an experiential uh, claim. It really is very strongly. Why? Because God is perfectly acquainted with the good. Uh, given divine simplicity, like God is like, just is the good itself. Uh, so he's identical to the good and he is goodness himself. So he is perfectly happy. And so that's an experiential knowledge that, that, that God has. So they can't say God has no phenomenal knowledge because then they're going to lose all the claims they want to make about divine blessedness or divine happiness. And that's a big oh, theme yeah. throughout the tradition that not doesn't get talked about as much today, um, but it is a major theme in the tradition. So they could make that move, but then they cut themselves off from very, very common uh, classical claims. Yeah. I mean, because uh, yeah, that's I didn't thought about that. Like a state of bliss is obviously a state of experiencing some but like, that's weird, though, because they they want to say, like, God doesn't have, like, feelings or anything like that. But then, like, bliss mm -hmm. is sort of like, maybe they could say it's like a, a state of existence. But I don't know what that would be if it wasn't experiential. So, yeah, that right. seems strange this to me is, as well. It's complicated because our English term for emotion covers a whole bunch of affective states that uh, throughout the Western tradition wouldn't have been classified, like, more sharply. So there's these things called passions, which... Nobody agrees on what a passion is, um, but they'll say God doesn't have those, whatever those are, and they'll disagree with what classifies as a passion. And on the other end, there's going to be these things called affections. Happiness is one of them. Bliss is one of them. Like, uh, and they'll say God can have those because those are possibly rational, they're moral, uh, and whatnot. So these affective, affective states, experiential states, God has some. Okay. Yeah. yeah what, do you have anything there, Joe, on the phenomenal? Yeah, no, that's yeah, really interesting. I mean I guess we're just like, we're just tiptoeing around the doctrine of analogy. Um, 
You know, because like Phaser, what Phaser is going to mm-hmm. say is like, well, God has emotion or emotions in some sense, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it's only analogously to us because in us it involves succession, it involves, um, you know, involves us being causally affected in certain ways. Um, it involves change, whereas in God it doesn't. So I mean, right. maybe maybe you were just ultimately getting at analogy. I don't know. Um, you don't need analogy for this. Uh, you can have some account of univocity uh, because the classical tradition is not committed to analogy. Nobody believed in like the Thomistic doctrine of analogy until yeah. Aquinas. And even then it was super controversial <laughs> and deeply rejected. So this is something like a medieval scholar like Thomas Williams will scold people on saying, do not like say this is essential to classical theism because then you're mm-hmm. going to exclude vast portions of the classical tradition who did not affirm this. And that's just, that just can't be right. Right, SCOTUS is being a great example of this. So, so an emotion you could say, like at rock bottom, is a felt evaluation of a situation. Uh, so it's got this cognitive component; it's about something, and then it's got this affective component. It's, it's, it's the way it feels. God's eternal or his timeless, immutable, undisturbed happiness. It's about something. It's about himself, and it feels a particular way: pure, undisturbed joy, pure, undisturbed bliss, felicity. There's lots of ways that the theologians talk about these things. Uh, that's an emotion. Univocally, God has it. You can say it's not intrinsic to an emotion that it is caused or, uh, or something, but it's about something. Okay, I, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, it's funny because we keep trying to brainstorm, like I'm trying to help the classical theists out, but sure. it's just like, yeah, it doesn't make any, doesn't make any sense <laughs> to right. say that, like, yeah, because going from because I mean, cause again, all the it, uh, this a lot of these problems like build on each other, right? Because this bleeds into stuff we've already said. Like because they're gonna say, well, there's not a moment in which God goes from knowing, like, oh, now it's what it's like to create a universe. Because as I already said, like they're gonna say he eternally is identical to the act of creation, so he's eternally identical to the act of knowing that he's a creator mm-hmm. and sustainer. So like, we've already covered all that though. Like it's all weird already. So like this builds on it. This is just kind of like uh you know, just one point on like a spearhead where it's like it's already we've built onto it. Because mm-hmm. like all, all the escape routes, we've kind of already covered getting to this point, right? Because like right, we've, already, exactly. we've already talked about like, you know, how that works with like creation and eternal willing. Because yeah, because like, you know, the classical theists responses are all pretty like obvious to this. They're just going to be like, well, there is no God doesn't have phenomenal experience in this sense because he's mm-hmm. eternally the creator. Yep. But that, that gets into weird problems too. Like again, we talked about emanation. Like how is it the case that, you know, he's eternally the creator, but you know, not. Right. So yeah. that's why I wanted to start out the conversation with let's define emanation, let's define eternal creation, and let's define creation ex nihilo, because all, a lot of these moves that if you appeal to like eternalist ontology of time, then it looks exactly like they're denying creation ex nihilo and affirming uh, an eternal creation. And maybe they can say they just like stomp their foot on the ground and say, no, I don't affirm eternal creation. But a whole bunch of people who do affirm eternal creation are going to go, your view looks identical to me. So tell me what the difference is. I say God exists without, uh, never exists without a universe. You say God never exists without a universe. You say God's eternally creating. I say God's eternally creating. You want to say uh, creation ex nihilo, but I want to be like, well, hang on, that doesn't make any sense because I deny that, and we all agree on, you know, what's going on here. That's just that just that just uh, can't be right. So yeah, yeah, that's that's why I think it's mm-hmm. important to get clear on some of these things. Uh, but you guys want to talk about the Oppie principle, though, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. So on so the handout I, get, I gave you, I had that like up front, but then I realized it's kind of question begging. So I was like, I'll put it towards the end here. Um, so it doesn't look like it's question begging. So Oppie has this principle that he uses uh, to say there's certain like um, cosmological arguments are just going to just just uh, like fall apart if you affirm this causal principle. So the causal principle is that um, you cannot have a cause that brings about an effect without the cause itself changing. And then he's like, we can actually, we look at all the cases of causes and effects that we know in the world. Every cause that we know of that brings about an effect undergoes a change. And you can, you can point to this, 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 and this, and they all undergo changes. And he's like, even quantum mechanics, uh, you, you can talk about um, these, these quantum particles, they bring about some sort of effect. Why? Because they themselves change. So in the very act, in the very process of bringing about an effect, the cause itself changes. So nothing can bring about an effect without undergoing change itself. And, and then he wants to generalize this to, he's like, well, it seems like I can generalize this to everything. So the, maybe it's just like a fundamental principle that applies to everything full stop. And so all these Thomistic arguments, cosmological arguments, that's, that's the Oppie's like target. They can't get up and running. Why? Because their conclusion is you've got a thing, 
a timeless being that doesn't change that causes and brings about a bunch of effects and be like, well, you can't be a, this timeless cause because everything that causes an effect undergoes a change itself. Now, why do I want to bring this up now instead of at the beginning? Because we've looked at all these different cases where it seems like there has to be a change and you've tried, and we looked at the different ways to try to get out of it and it just seems so implausible. And so this is the point where I think like Graham Oppie can come in and be like, haha, I told you, this is super plausible. <laughs> uh, like you can try to get rid of it, but whew, what are you going to be left with? That just, you know, you're going to be left with something that seems really implausible. So the classical theists, what they have to do at this point is they have to reject this causal principle and they're going to want to, they're going to have to, because otherwise they're going to lose all of God's interactions with the world and they're going to lose any kind of any sense of creation. So they have to reject this principle, but they have to replace it with something that is at least as intuitive or at least not too terribly unintuitive as, as Oppie's principle itself. And then on top of that, they have to explain away all of these problems that we've pointed out and, and explain that they're not really that implausible. They're not really that big of a deal. They have to explain all of that away. That's the right. Burden. And then it, it yeah, it, Okay. Well, it's because it seems like they'd also have to explain why their causal principle like only applied to God, because it seems like yes. Oppie's principle applies to like most examples of causation we see just all over the place. Yes. So they'd have to explain why there's like this arbitrary, well, maybe not arbitrary, that'd be question begging, but like there's right. this exception in God's case, but yes. in every other case, this causal principle applies. So it seems like there's a lot of baggage they have to deal with. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to do a couple things with this. I'm sure Joe will have comments. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to pile on to it and bring in like the difference principle as well. So this is where we're going to get more to like oh, yeah. we're getting now more into like an outright sure. contradiction. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit, but I also wanted to talk about, I mean, maybe one answer. Um, we we teased this out we a little bit earlier. We talked about how like there may be, and I don't know if this would even function as an answer. I don't know that it would, but just there, we could talk about it anyways because it's interesting. Just the idea that you know maybe causes like being simultaneous with effects, but obviously mm -hmm. like they're being because this will be relevant to temporal changes and causation, right? Because, like, obviously, if, I, I tend to think that just intuitively, like, causes are temporally prior to their effects. That just makes sense to me. But there is, like, this doctrine, especially in classical theism, that, like, you know, there can be simultaneous causation. And that's one thing they bring in a lot, too. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that and how it's applicable. Because, Joe, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but not that much. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit. Um, I do really like this principle, but I think we can pile more on with the difference mm -hmm. principle that... Um, so yeah, so I don't know if you guys want to talk so anything about let's that. Let's get rid of simultaneity. Uh, let's just get rid of that from the start. Here's why. So I said at the, at the beginning of this conversation, Paul Helm points out that if you've got a timeless being, he cannot stand in any temporal relation with temporal, other things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So simultaneity, that just is a temporal relation Yeah. Uh, by definition. Like that's what simultaneity is. So it cannot be the case that you could appeal to uh, simultaneous causation to help out and help explain how a timeless God brings about temporal effects. So that's just off the table right there. Good. So you could have yeah. that, but it's not going to help because you can't have God, a timeless God uh, interacting simultaneously with anything. Right. Yeah. I just really wanted yeah. to hammer this one home. So I wanted to bring that back. Sure. Here, <laughs> sure, sure. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now let's talk. I mean, I guess if Joe, if you have anything before that, we can talk about this and I'll, I want you to talk about the difference principle too. some, but if you have anything else, well, okay. Before we get into all that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. So, I wrote down, these are really short, so it's not like mm -hmm. I'm going to go through this long list. It'll take me like mm -hmm. 10 minutes. No. Um, I wrote down five, I mean, we've already covered some of them, but I wrote down five different objections that the classical theist might bring to this Oppie principle. So the first one is just the limits of empirical generalization. Um, I mean, this kind of applies to all empirical generalizations, but, you know, like, yeah. we could say, well, everything in our empirical experience is physical. Well, so therefore everything, I mean, I know he doesn't say, well, therefore, but like, so we've reason to think that everything is physical. Now, all theists are going to really want to reject that for the most yeah. part. So I just want to point out that it's like empirical generalization, like we have to kind of ask, like, well, what would we expect? Um, if classical, the I mean, if classical, we could think Bayesian in Bayesian terms, like mm -hmm. what would we expect if classical theism is true? Well, I mean our experience is only of secondary causality, you know, like of things in this material world. And so, you know, it seems as though this bleeds into my other problem, which is the limits of the evidential and intuitive base, experiential base, right? Mm -hmm. So we only have experience with secondary causality. And so I'm wondering how Avi is going to bridge this gap, justify inferences about primary causality when mm -hmm. the intuitive when the abductive and experiential and inductive base is only in terms of secondary causality and things around us. Um, so I'm wondering, it, I mean, that's, that's kind of one problem. I just, I mm, covered two yeah. of them just there. Um, so maybe we could speak about that. Yeah. I mean, 
I had I, I had a couple little things, but then I'm sure Ryan will have some too. Basically, I was going to say that like I think it's good points about like just kind of being epistemically humble and like aware. Mm -hmm. um, but as as Ryan says in his paper, like this is a principle that like we can't probably like generalize and like confirm it, but it seems intuitively plausible, and a lot of our empirical you know verification seems to affirm it. So we can't, of course, be like certain about these sort of like universifiable uh, or generalizing causal principles, right? But the same thing we talked about with Cambridge changes too. Like we only have knowledge of Cambridge changes in secondary causation. And so they're going to say the primary, you know, act of Cambridge changes is different than the second ones we're observing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'd say the same thing we said there. Like we can't maybe verify this for certainty, but we can run maybe like a Bayesian argument. I know because Joe, you love Bayesian arguments sure. that like, you know, it seems more intuitive. And, and I think as Ryan said, like he covered it a little bit. We're like, if they are going to deny this principle, they're going to have to replace it with one that is at least, you know, is, is as of, it seems intuitively as good, or is maybe just at least not super unintuitive. And so I think those are good points to keep in mind, because it's like, yeah, we do have to be careful when we're talking about causal mm -hmm. principles and universalizing them. Yeah. But I think we have good reason, as Ryan has said, to think that this one's pretty plausible, and any replacement for it is going to be less plausible than it. But I'm not certain of that. I just kind of find it intuitively uh, interesting, but Ryan, did you have anything else there? Um, I had a thought on if classical theism is true, what should I expect to follow from it? And and so this is, I think it was really quite interesting when you look at classical theism as a whole outside of the Christian tradition. So I brought up a bunch of different thinkers who want to deny creation ex nihilo and want to affirm either emanation or eternal creation. Why? Because they're like, we've got an eternal God who's, make, who's an eternal cause, so obviously it's going to bring about eternal effects. Like, this is what you should expect. And the reason creation ex nihilo is so controversial when it gets up and running in, like, uh, in the early days of the, the Christian church is because it just seems to fly in the face of this. And then you, ha and then you have to ex do all this explaining away. Then you have to start making all these weird claims about God's not really related to the universe and all this. Whereas all these other people are going, just get rid of creation ex nihilo. You should expect that an eternal God who's an eternal cause will bring about eternal effect. Like, come on, guys. Like, this is just what we should expect. And then you see Aquinas, like, even, like... <sighs> Because the scientists, because Aristotle, because the philosopher said so, going like, my faith says this, but philosophy says this. We can affirm both in some senses, you know, it's fine. Uh, just kind of like drop the, and just leave it at that. I think that's what we should expect. If we're going to do a Bayesian analysis, I think we should expect that creation ex nihilo will be false. If you uh, put oh, in like, yeah, so I think if you put in, if you're in your priors, if you put in timelessness, immutability, all this sort of stuff, I think you're going to get creation ex nihilo is false. And that's what you mm -hmm. see historically lay out um, when you're not looking at the Christian tradition, when you're looking at Aristotle, for instance, when you're looking at uh, I mean, uh, uh, the pagans uh, tradition and all these different Islamic thinkers who were declared as heretics because they denied Christian ex nihilo, but they're like, I'm giving you an eternal God. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. It's just like, uh, I mean, one way is just like, I don't know. That that was my first. So okay, those are my first two problems. The not the other mm -hmm. one was just like, well, Phaser's natural theological response, like, oh well, I already just gave a deductive demonstration of it, so it's just right. a consequence. But we already kind of covered that. So that was the third yeah. problem. Um, and then the two others, which I thought were interesting, is one accepting Oppie's principle would seem to entail that an infinite per se chain um, is possible and indeed actual. Um, because per se chains, right, are things that are sort of right here, right now, a case where um, a potency is reduced to actuality. And uh, that potency is reduced to actuality derivatively in the sense of being an instrumental cause of something more fundamental. Um, and, you know, there's this sort of per se chain uh, as opposed to a per accidents chain that stretches back in time. But mm -hmm. if it is the case that whenever something more fundamental actualizes the potential or causes uh, something less fundamental to change, if it is the case that that thing must in turn change in doing so, well then that thing's going to require some sort of explanation as to why it reduces from potency to act to cause mm -hmm. that, in which case we're drawn down to infinity, ad infinitum. So mm -hmm. it seems that if we accept that every change requires a cause, or every everything that is reduced from potency to actuality requires an actualizer, if we accept that, and we accept that whenever something actualizes another thing's potency, that is to say, whenever something causes another thing to occur, it itself undergoes a change. Well, then it seems as though we're going to be drawn down ad infinitum in this per se chain. And then mm -hmm. the natural thing is, is just to do the modus tollens version well. You can't have an infinite per se chain. Um, 
which is just like central to, well, to arguments for classical theism. And then so it follows that Oppie's principle is false. Or one of the two principles that every change requires some sort of change or cause or Oppie's principle. So I was, that was the fourth problem. So hang on, I, I want to make sure I'm following this. Uh, so, so the objection is, if I take the Oppie principle, I'm going to get this infinite regress. Is that that's the big idea? I'm missing yeah, so, but, why if, I get the infinite regress because if all I need to say is um, anything that any cause that brings about an effect undergoes change itself, I could still have a first cause. Yeah, you've got, you you've got God just sitting there doing nothing, um, mm -hmm. and then He does stuff, so He causes stuff, and He undergoes a change because you can't have any cases of cause and effect without change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's that's an excellent point um, that I I didn't clarify it too well, but okay. we have to add in an extra principle that whatever mm. reduces from potency to act or whatever changes is changed. So is caused to change. Um, oh, by or, something sorry, outside whatever, of itself. Whatever reduces, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, something distinct from the potency in question. So whatever yeah. reduces from potency to act or whatever changes is changed or caused to change by another where the another is just not the terminus of the change. So it's, it's what Phaser uses in his Aristotelian proof. Mm -hmm. It's the mm -hmm. Aristotelian causal principle. It's also what uh, Aquinas uses in his first way. Whatever is changed is changed yeah. by another. So once we add that in and we accept that um, whenever something causes another thing, it itself undergoes change, well, then we're just... We're, then we're going to be cast down into this infinite regress. So right. it, it wouldn't allow spontaneous changes where the thing that spontaneously causes, or it wouldn't allow spontaneous causation where the thing um, in which, or sorry, I'm going to restart that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> it would not allow a case wherein God or a particle spontaneously causes something to change and itself undergoes a change but yet is not itself caused to do so by something. So, um, and that seems to involve mm -hmm. uh, an infinite regress of, at least a per se regress. So maybe right. it entails a, a per accidens regress, but they're fine with that. Most classical theists are. Um, I'm not well, certain so, I'm, I'm fully following, but it, what it sounds like is I've got this, I've got Oppie's principle, and then I'm sneaking in another, like, uh, Aristotelian principle on top of it. An Aristotelian principle that most classical theists use to derive classical theism yeah. in the first place. So right, exactly. Either... And that's the I thing mean, is, so exactly. Oppie's principle, if it's supposed to be like really fundamental, then uh, like uh, Graham Oppie could just be like, no, I don't need anything else. This is this is the fundamental principle. Uh, you know, give me some reason for thinking this other thing. Uh, this other principle yeah, is a well, resilient principle. We would need some sort of symmetry breaker between the two principles. But the thing is, the classical theist, um, well, my point is just that the classical theist is like, hey, like I already accept this other principle. I just used it in my first way of proving God's existence, right. you know, like Aquinas. And so you're just like, well, when I take this other first principle and I, I combine it with Oppies, we get an infinite per se chain. That, that can't be the case. So right. we need some sort of symmetry breaker. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think I think if you want, if you or Oppie wants to affirm this this one, I think you guys also might have to give a symmetry breaker as to why we should prefer this one as opposed to the, the Aristotelian principle. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I guess... Hey, there's a couple ways to go. One is like, well, I don't get an infinite regress if I just have the Oppie principle. Uh, so, you know, no big deal. There's no problem here. So I don't even see like what the objection would be. Uh, the second thing would be like um, this, this like Aristotelian principle that we're sneaking in. I just don't, I just don't find it obvious. I, it seems really clear to me that like, if you've got a free agent, that agent can bring about uh, effects by itself. It can be self-caused uh, in the sense of like not doing something, uh, thinking and considering its reasons and going, I want that one. I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, I you actually say do reasons or that causes, be... um, and that's fine, but it wouldn't be call it'd be a teleological cause or something yeah, that sort yeah. of like that. It wouldn't be an efficient cause. Uh, so the Oppie's principle is only about efficient causation. Yeah. Yeah. My, so my, I, I think that's the point. Yeah. Yeah, no. My thought, Joe, I don't know if, if Ryan will, would want to like endorse this response. I don't know what his thoughts are on existential inertia, but Joe, you and I have talked about existential inertia before in regards to like per se you know, chains, essentially ordered series. So, I mean, I, that one response I thought of there, like, uh, to avoid the infinite regress is kind of like what Ryan said with the first mover. But you and I have talked about that, too. Like, you know, uh, per se chains could just bottom out and not be something that can go on, will go on existing unless it's caused not to exist. So an object with existential inertia, we could have, like, per se chains bottom out there. Um, it's kind of like the first mover, but it also doesn't require... And yeah, I kind of share Ryan's intuition there that like I don't see why I should add the principle on top of it because it maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like the principle you're talking about is one of the ones in Phaser's proof. It's either four or seven that Oppie would actually deny. 
Mm-hmm. That like you know that there has to well, be like, this concurrent yeah. sustaining. Yeah. So like, it seems like there you're building in. I guess one maybe possible symmetry breaker then is that we're kind of with the Aristotelian principle. There's like a simplicity charge against it because we're building in sort of like the sustaining concurrent causation, which we don't have to accept if we sort of just like you know shave off that. Uh, we kind of have a simpler account with just the oppie principle than we do with the thing. So maybe that's, I don't know if that would count as a symmetry breaker though, but oh, I can give you something I think simpler. Uh, so I don't need existential inertia to, to do this. So all I need is a necessarily existent being that's temporal. Um, and I've, and I've already affirmed that. So this is a being that endures mm-hmm. and is causing all this other stuff. So I don't even need to add in uh, existential inertia to, to get this. Right, so maybe yeah, Ryan's response is that, and the naturalist response is like maybe someone from Oppie's perspective, his response mm-hmm. is something more like existential inertia. But yeah, Ryan yeah, doesn't even right. need that. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, so yeah, that's definitely. Right. Well, I think There's I think a that's a kind. I think that's a species of existential inertia. Just the most fundamental thing in reality, or the fundamental thing of temporal reality, namely God, has this sort of built-in tendency to persist and endure, um, beginninglessly, necessarily, and so on. Um, well, I think it might necessarily, be necessarily, it wouldn't of... be a tendency, though, would it? Because I thought existential inertia was like, uh, exist unless something makes it not exist. Is that right? Well, okay, there, there are different Because I've different never taken this seriously, so I, I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there, are, there are different kinds. So I mm-hmm. guess I should specify that. You can have... Okay. Um, so, for instance, if something is necessarily existent, well, then clearly it couldn't be the case that something would come along and break it apart, like, you know, yeah. cause it to cease to exist. Um, whereas less fundamental things that are contingent, that could be the case. Um, right. But if we're, if we're construing it solely as, you know, this is a being which is temporal and which is persisting in existence without a sustaining cause, well, then in some sense it has um, a resistance to change there, a resistance to going out of existence and, and persisting. But it depends uh, on how we define, it depends on how we define existential inertia. Yeah, because mm-hmm. because then it seems like... Um any necessarily existent being is going to have existential inertia. Like, so like the number two uh, has existential well, inertia. I, I don't think two exists. It's for time. concrete. It like in, inertia is oh, like it's only for concrete. Okay. Time. It's usually for well, concrete. Well, and it's all yeah. temporal concrete, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, temporal okay. Concrete. But, but that, that's getting into the weeds a little bit. Yeah, too yeah. Much. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, uh, okay, so my, that was the fourth problem, namely mm-hmm. entailing an infinite per se chain. When we combine it with uh, this extra... Um, yeah, principle, right. we would need some sort of symmetry breaker. Um, well, that the was fifth... your fourth. Now I'm scared for the fifth. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this one, this one isn't as um, as elaborate. But the, the fifth okay. one is just like, well, now, now, once we accept Oppie's principle, we no longer have an explanation as to why there are any changes. Oh my goodness, Peyton! Sorry, my dog just barked. She wants to go inside. I'll, I got two seconds. <laughs> It's the life of quarantine philosophy. You have it to is. Deal with. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it, it seems as though if we accept Oppie's principle, we don't. We no longer have an explanation of why there are any changeable beings at all. Okay. Uh, it, so long as we rule out in our in our notion of explanation something which presupposes the very thing in need of explanation. Um, mm-hmm. So why why is that? Well, at least under like classical theism, like we have an immutable being, an unchangeable being that can provide at least some sort of explanation. I mean, I know we've just been battering it with all these right. reasons why I couldn't, but we have some sort of explanation as to why there are changeable beings at all. The type, why the type changeable being is instantiated, right? But if we accept Oppie's principle, then we, I mean, it, it entails a sort of inexplicability or oh. rudeness with respect to mm-hmm. why there are any changeable beings at all. Um, because under Oppie's mm-hmm. principle, well, everything's a changeable being so long as it has, you know, causal power to bring about something. Um, yeah. And so there can be no changeable being, which accounts for why there are changeable beings in the first place. So, for instance, I mean, not even God could do it because he's a changeable being. So he would sort of already presuppose the instantiation of type. Now, I know there is there's self-explanation. Um, yes. So, like, you could say, well, God is self-explaining and he explains everything else. Um, but so, I mean, I, I mean, I would want to explicitly define explanation in terms of we're ruling out circular explanation or an explanation which presupposes the thing that mm. you're trying to explain. Um, yeah. And so I guess, I guess the classical theist, this is my like last two sentences. Sure. <laughs> so I guess the classical theist could say like, if we accept all these principles, then we get a sort of bruteness or inexplicability, mm. um, which is a theoretical vice. Whereas yeah. if we don't do that, if we reject it, well then we, we don't, automatically get this bruteness or this inexplicability. Um, yeah. And I would say pulling out circular explanations is better than 
than having an explanation, but it being circular. Um, yeah, let's get rid of all circular explanations. That's 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 not good. I do. Um, oh. Yeah. So I, I guess I don't see why it would leave the existence of changeable beings inexplicable. So if you take uh, God to be like a you know the greatest possible being, the greatest metaphysically possible being, then you start asking, well, what would that being be like? And then you start running through like standard perfect being kind of claims of like he's got whatever is better to have than not have. Seems like free will. That's better to have than not have, right? Um, it seems like having power. Ooh, maybe all power. That's better to have than not have. Well, if I've got power and I've got freedom, why is there a changeable being? Well, that's just what what it means to have power and freedom. Uh, because freedom means like the ability to like do something or not do something, uh, to bring about an effect at the next moment. So like it's so that I feel like the changeability it's built right into the very idea of agency and the very idea of God being a person with free will. So I don't. I feel like I don't have any anything like that's left unexplained. Um, you might say it like relies on an ontological argument or something. And I know Oppie's going to be like, "Well, I've got a million reasons for why you shouldn't buy any <laughs> ontological arguments." Um, but I, I don't know. I just I, I find some of the modal ontological arguments really convincing. Um, but I don't even. I guess I don't need that. I just need perfect being theology. Is all I really need. Uh, and you get agency right right there from the start. It, uh, if you think that agency is better to have than not have. And I don't see why it would not be better to have. Uh, so I guess your response is like, well, so like it just wouldn't be possible for there to be an unchangeable being that explains why there are changeable beings, maybe? like. Yeah, exactly. Like, why should I think that there would be unchangeable beings, uh, especially if, like, if, if, the, if the heart of reality, the center of reality is theistic, then the center of reality, the fundamental thing is an agent. And part of agency, it seems to me, is the ability to bring about effects to go from potential to actual to a exercise powers that's part of like the idea of it yeah sorry i'm yeah. distracted by this wasp that is in <laughs> sure yeah. It is... Yeah. <laughs> no I, i'm just like staring at it just left so i'm i got my shoe off and i'm ready to hit it but poor peter singer i was making this joke earlier like, yeah, yeah i was ready to like him. spite peter singer um, but yeah, yeah okay, so I guess, I guess you could say like, no, it's not an explanatory deficit of my account that I don't have a non-circular explanation of why there are any changeable beings at all, because if there were a non-circular explanation of cha why there are any changeable beings at all, well, then we'd have an unchangeable being that is causing other things, and we have all these difficulties with that, all these problems with that, so I guess maybe that's your, that's your response, is that like... No, I don't see really where, the, where the circularity comes in. That's, 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 I guess that's the thing, is like, it just seems like... It, it falls right out of the very concept of perfection, the greatest metaphysically possible being, which I take to be an agent. And it just it falls out of the concept of having freedom, that you have the ability to do one thing or another, and the ability to then to do something else, and then to do something else. Like, it all seems oh, like okay. built into it. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So well, I yeah. guess I haven't clarified my notion of um, explanation. And So what I mean is, like, um, explaining why something exists. Um, and so, oh, yeah. I, it, so why something exists, and... Um, and it's not going to be in terms of whatever the explanandum is, whatever, like, we can't have an explanation of that, which presupposes the very thing in need of explanation. So that's, that's the notion of explanation. And then it's explaining why something exists. So right. if we're talking about God's changeability, sure, that might like conceptually flow from or be explained by his perfection, but there's still the question of like, well, why are there any changeable beings at all? And you can't cite a changeable being as to why there are any changeable beings at all, right? Because that presupposes oh. that the type changeable being is instantiated. So yeah, um, that's why I referenced the ontological like, arguments because it seems like or perfect being theology. Because if 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 you think like God's a necessarily existent being, uh, well, and and it's a perfect being, well, what's just going to follow from those very concepts here? So mm -hmm. I've got the necessary existence. That's it seems like that's built into the concept of a of a, the greatest metaphysically possible being. What else is built into that concept? You know. Power, freedom, knowledge, mm -hmm. blah, 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 so on and so on. All these things that seem to wrap up in agency. Like the explanation is right, all right in there. It's yeah, yeah. So I guess, I guess you're using different notions of, of explanation, which is good. I'm glad yeah. we got this clarity out here. Different yeah. notions of explanation. So I was mainly talking about explaining why a being uh, mm -hmm. exists. So, for instance, like I, you know, there's an explanation of why. I'm, I'm, I'm turning into Josh Rasmussen. Yeah, yeah you're totally Josh. <laughs> I pick so up my bottle. Here's, yeah. ball. here's this here's cup. A cup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, here's a cup. So there, there's an explanation of why this cup exists. So then we could talk about the type cup, right? So like yeah. why 
what explains why the type cup is instantiated in reality? Mm -hmm. Well, it can't be in terms of a cup, right? Because that presupposes the very thing in need of explanation. So then yeah. we can talk about the type changeable being, right? So yeah. what explains why the type changeable being is instantiated in reality? Well, we can't cite like a changeable being because, you know, that already sort of ex mm -hmm. presupposes that there are changeable beings in reality. So then the only, it seems as though the only explanation could be in terms of um, an unchangeable being, right? But, and, but your relevant, your notion of explanation here is sort of like, um, it sort of falls out of, as it were, yeah. uh, notions of perfection and necessary yeah. existence together. Um, yeah. So I think once we once we get clear on our notion of explanation, we can see where we're yeah, butting heads. Exactly. Here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my uh, I, Joe, we should talk about that objection later because I I want to talk about like, the possible naturalist responses, but that's not uh, sure. That's not relevant here. Um, so we got so we're like we're approaching two hours so we could mm -hmm. if we want to talk about i want to be respectful one of last Ryan's thing time yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we could, we could talk about the difference principle yeah but that might that take us well like no, I mean, we could do maybe i could do 10 yeah, more yeah. minutes yeah so if you want to do the difference yeah, principle i was gonna say i was just gonna close out with a, a new segment called what will the thomas say and then we got to answer the <laughs> we got to end then we got to answer the most important question, which is, of course, since God's a person, what kind of music does he like? We already know the answer. So that, we'll just end off on those things. But if we want to talk about the difference principle briefly, see, I was like for five, five or eight minutes, then just end off with those little no, things. No, no. So that's fine with me. Yeah. OK, sound good. So, yeah, Joe, do you want because this principle, it seems to kind of like it seemed it struck me as sort of like similar to the difference principle. Right. Mm -hmm. Of like, well, you know, for any for any cause that has an effect like the the causal agent is going to change as well so it kind of struck me it's not the same as the difference principle but it's very similar of like well then if there's a difference in the effect it's causing then there's got to be a difference in the in the thing that's causing the effect yeah so uh, joe you've formulated this as an argument and uh, steven you had a podcast episode about oh this yeah with steven well. Amesh, yeah 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 uh, but then joe you formulated it. it was one of your your big like blog arguments like if you want to run through that joe really quick why it's a problem specifically for classical theism we talk it's kind of similar to the reason the afi principle is but there's a little more to it so mm -hmm. yeah if you want to run through yeah, that quickly yeah. um so the difference principle that name comes from Stephen demesh um i think that's how you pronounce it mm -hmm. um but i so the way i like to i did this in my latest blog post i altered it to the edp the explanatory difference principle so differences mm -hmm. in um explananda so, for instance, if this cup were red instead of black, there would be a difference in something that needs explanation. Um, and, and so the, the, the claim is for the EDP is that differences in explananda, so what is to be explained, presupposes, or presuppose, I'll just use presupposes, presupposes differences in the explanation um, that can account for why there are differences in the the effect or the explanandum. Right. So, for mm -hmm. instance, um, I couldn't just use black um, pigment or whatever um, and somehow get red out of it to get this, you know, like they would have to, I would have to use different pigment for instance, or right. something along those lines. Right. So there'd have to be a difference in the total cause that accounts for why there's this difference in the total effect. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, I alter this and I talk about, um, quantum mechanics cause that's an immediate objection that people raise. And I talk about libertarian freedom in my blog post. So I, if people have those objections, I, I'd refer them to that. Um, but the problem with classical theism though, is that, um, we can take the explanandum, namely the world itself, mm -hmm. and the world itself could have been different lest we get modal collapse, right? So there is at right. least some contingent thing in the world. So if there's some contingent thing in the world, well, then the world could have been different. Um, now, if the world could have been different, by the, difference, by the explanatory difference principle, something in the explanation of the world could have been different, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the explanation of the world under classical theism is God. Uh, yes. and God's activity, and but those two are identical, so it's God, right? But that means that God could have been different, right? And so, uh, but, you know, what is this difference? Well, it couldn't be in terms of an accidental feature, because God doesn't have accidents, right? Right. Um, under classical theism. It couldn't right. be in difference in terms of essential features, because if X has a different essential feature in a different world, well, that just means that it doesn't exist in one of the worlds, right? <laughs> right, um, yeah. So, it, so, and it also can't be in terms of a extrinsic Cambridge relation, right? Because whether or not God stands in any Cambridge relations to something apart from itself already presupposes that there is an effect in the first place. Yes. So it can't account for differences in the effect because it already presupposes there's an effect. So yes. um, there would have to be, I mean, I think 
the, I think the theistic personalist can easily explain this. There would have to be some sort of accidental feature, say, um, mm -hmm. or maybe God has different desires or different reasons that are really distinct from one another uh, that right. could account for why one one effect is produced rather than another. Um, so that's the basic gist. The classical theist, the, the argument is, if classical theism is true, EDP is false. But EDP is true, so classical theism is false. That's that's the oh, argument right. essentially. Um, and the theistic, this is not a problem for theism simpliciter. Um, it's only a problem for classical theism. Cla right. uh, theistic personalists like, um, you know, Swinburne, you, I mean, granting the legitimacy of the term. Sure, like, sure, sure. Um, yeah. You know, they have an explanation, right? They can say, like, look, God has different desires and different reasons that are, ex that are explanatorily efficacious in different worlds. And he yes. chooses on the basis of those reasons differently in different worlds and these reasons are really distinct and so there are differences in the cause which can explain why there are differences in the effect but that's not available to the classical theist yes i think that's right. right especially when you start building in like all the claims of simplicity that you've done you can throw yeah. even more in there which is impassibility which again says god cannot be causally influenced or influenced simpliciter by anything uh, outside of himself. And so when you start seeing people try to tease this out in terms of doctrines of providence or creation, election, uh, predestination, you're like, well, why did God elect you and not this other person? Well, it couldn't be about anything that you are or anything that you do, uh, because then God would not be impassable. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're like, well, then why? It's like, well, it's uh, for his own mysterious reasons. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, well, I don't think he could have reasons because the reasons are like, they're about other things. Like, well, like this, it couldn't be about himself. Um, that one doesn't make any sense. So, and you see this played out in the Islamic tradition too, where there are some Islamic classical theists who just want to say, God just doesn't act for reasons because that would imply that God would be undergoing change. It would imply that, um, God could be other ways. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, I think, I think where you're pointing out yeah, a, a very serious problem that people in the past have noticed, um, mm -hmm. outside of the Christian tradition. And it's, it's a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one thing I thought about, the one like answer that may be given that I hadn't seen yet and I just thought of when you were saying it, I actually, I thought of it and I was like, ooh, that's interesting. Then the more I thought about what you guys were talking, I was like, I don't think it works. But I'll still bring it up. Basically, I was going to say, because I was thinking in terms of like how people think of like theistic explanation and God creating mm -hmm. the world and specifically Proust's account where it's more specific of like, well, you know, the explanation for this particular universe, possible world as opposed to another is because God chose this one. So I was thinking maybe that like the difference in the cause of this universe isn't a difference in God. It's a difference in God's choice. So like, therefore they can escape the argument by saying, but God is identical like, to God's choice. But right. But <laughs> that, yeah. that doesn't work. God is identical to God's choice. Right. Oh, well, and then I also thought that like, maybe, you know, explanation, we can't, I can't equivocate there on like explanation and cause. So it was like this is interesting, but it still doesn't work. So it's still a problem for classical theism. Uh, yeah, you can dig the knife in a bit more. So there's this uh, scholastic distinction between um, God's, uh, what's it called, uh, God's uh, imminent actions and his transitive actions. So his imminent actions are actions like directed towards himself. And the, the classic example is supposed to be like the doctrine of the Trinity. So like God causing, the Father causing the Son to exist and causing the Holy Spirit to exist. And those are all imminent. Uh, transitive actions, though, those are actions that God does not necessarily do, whereas the imminent actions he necessarily does. The transitive actions God contingently does. And the, the, they're directed towards things outside of God. So the universe is supposed to be this case. So the explanation there has to be different from the explanation of the imminent actions. So the imminent actions, like why does God, uh, the Father cause the Son to exist? Well, like, well just, it, just, it couldn't be any other way. And you're like, okay, cool. Um, or why does God do this? Well, because he's necessarily good. And so God just is always doing things that are, you know, glorify himself or do for his own good. And you're like, okay, cool. What about the transitive actions though? That needs a, that needs a different explanation because that's a contingent effect and it's supposed to have a contingent explanation. What's that? And it can't be anything that's, uh, it can't be something like, well, God always acts for his own good because that's, that's a, that's an imminent action action. That's something God necessarily does. So it can't be something like, well, God always acts for his own glory. Like he's already got glory intrinsically and essentially. So it's a imminent action. That's not a transitive action what's going on here? I need a, so I need something else to explain these, these things here. And what is that? And that's, that's, and that's, so it seems like this distinction is in fact presupposing the, uh, explanatory principle that you're talking about here, uh, or this difference making principle. That's, that seems like that's just built into this scholastic distinction between imminent and transitive actions. That's so they can deny it if they I... want, but then you're going to get rid of this, uh, this deeply reformed and deeply, uh, scholastic account.
That's super interesting. I've never, I haven't thought of it in that light. So mm -hmm. I'll actually try to take that into account when I'm thinking sure. about this further. That's that's super great. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And I, uh, one last thing I want to note before we go into like the mm -hmm. last two minutes. Uh -huh. the last two minutes is just like, like, I would argue that most of the cosmological principles that that classical theists employ sure. for arguing for classical theism, the same reasoning that supports those supports the explanatory difference principle. Is it inductive generalization? Is it intuition? Is it a demand for an explanation? Is it abduction? Is it um, things can't pop into existence for no reason? I mean, all the all the the justifications for these causal principles that they adduce seems uh, to equally apply to the explanatory difference principle. Um, yes. And so that seems to be a problem um, because then, you, I mean, you seem forced, if you're going to accept these, you seem forced to be able to accept this one, you know? So um, I try, I tried to also point that out in the, the blog post, but. Oh, right. So that, yeah, because the way you could develop it is, okay, well, you want to get rid of all these principles in order to get rid of the difference making principle. Cool. Well, now you don't have any cosmological arguments. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, okay, that seems less cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's the way you could do this. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, nice, that's a nice strategy. I like it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we got some new stuff going. All right. Well, this has been fun. So now the final segment, mm -hmm. we need to start doing yes. this like every video is the what will Thomas say just to figure it out. Like, <laughs> I think, I, let's see, we got to predict because like, there's going to be some responses. So I'm, I'm going to go with, of course, you haven't read Aquinas. Uh, yeah. That one's just analogy, a given. That's, a, analogy, that's like the bingo. Analogy. Yeah, analogy. analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't understand, if you haven't read Phaser, uh, his Theopolis discussion or whatever. That was, that's uh, true. I never read his, his, his uh, Theopolis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian's never read it. I, I never right, read it. Right, right. So somebody's going to be like, oh, you don't understand. It's going to be either you didn't read it or you didn't understand it. Um, yeah. Probably Cambridge possible. changes. I'm sure mm -hmm. we don't understand Cambridge those. Cambridge changes, yeah. Mystic yeah. Ineffability. Maybe ineffability. Ineffable mystery is a good one. Uh, I guess fun fact uh, for all of these is Thomas, like in the actual like academic like setting, um, disagree on just about like everything, including what they think Aquinas said. So I guess like if, if I really wanted to be cheeky, like, you know, any anybody who's just like, you just didn't understand Aquinas would be like, well, this other Thomistic scholar says I did. Maybe that one says I didn't, <laughs> but this one does. So like, uh, that's fine. I don't care. Or maybe they don't themselves don't understand Aquinas. I don't know. Uh, there's lots okay, of it sounds you... like it sounds like Fraser doesn't Aquinas? completely. <laughs> yeah, Aquinas didn't understand Aquinas. <laughs> oh, Aquinas or no, yeah. Fraser. Phaser doesn't understand Aquinas, right? Because we talked about how uh, the extrinsic, you know, the simplicity doesn't even allow for those Cambridge relations, but he, he breathed those in. So. There is a summer seminar on Thomistic philosophy. And I remember hearing a story a few years ago uh, where some people were talking about, like, I know these are all like, like top-notch Thomistic scholars. And some of them were joking around just a bit saying, like, I, kept, I think they kept using the phrase little Eddie Phaser, I think is what they kept saying. And they're like, well, you know, there's like what we're doing here on this like account. And there's a little Eddie Phaser's account of like Thomism, kind of like like he understands it differently than we do. So just to give you an idea of like, <laughs> like you know, like people like in the in within these like th uh, uh, different movements, like they really do disagree on how do we interpret these these thinkers. Because when you've got someone like Aquinas, I mean, he's he wrote like just a ridiculous amount of things. I, so of course yeah. he's going to contradict himself at some point in there. Maybe an evolution of thought, or maybe he just I don't know. Maybe he just flat out contradicted himself. And that's what all these scholars are trying to figure out. Just like how do we really develop a Thomistic system? And they're going to look different because you're going to have all these contradictions that you're going to try to like get rid of to develop a coherent system. So, meh, what else? That's hilarious. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, final. So, we, yeah, we kind of know the predictable responses there and mentioned them. But yeah, mm -hmm. final, the question, I, a big question I had for Ryan, the most important one mm -hmm. was, you know, God being a person and like temporal change and all that, like surely he's got like a music preference. So mm -hmm. what music does God prefer? My answer, I was like, surely metal, right? But I don't know. Obviously. Don't... Yeah. Yeah, so right, right. yeah, it's going to it's gonna have to be probably like black metal is my guess. Um, <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I take that back. It might be doom metal because like doom metal songs, like they're so ridiculously long. So like a doom metal band is going to put out an album, like, a, like they're going to put out an EP. So it's like four, four tracks. And it's going to be like two hours long, right? Because their songs are ridiculous. <laughs> And you've got to talking about like an eternal being has always existed and like will always will exist. He's got tons of time. So like doom metal just seems like that just seems that seems what you should expect. Uh, you should predict um, uh, God to enjoy. Yeah. OK. Yeah, Bayesian that's pretty plausible. Mm -hmm. Bayesianism yeah. for the win. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was like thinking something like yeah, Norwegian black metal or some sort of death. But yeah, no, that makes that makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that's the biggest question answered. So it's great. Here we go. Anyways, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins, thank you so much for coming on. This was super fun, super illuminating. Thanks for everybody for watching. If you made it this far, Joe, thanks for coming back. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time.